Hi, everybody. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Our first hour is general discussion about uh, all things media and virtual production. Second hour is usually something or someone we want to spend a little more time with. Today, we're going to have Renee Robin on. She's an incredible Photoshop artist, and she's going to join us at 8 o'clock and answer your questions. Um, so stay tuned for that. Also, just a quick uh, note that we will have a live stream. Uh, it'll go actually on my channel and possibly the Office Hours channel uh, with Brian Vanderark. He's the lead singer for The Verve Pipe, and he's going to do a little special one hour. We hope it turns out well. It's a little bit of an experiment on our end. Um, but he, we just did a rehearsal with him last night. And it was stunning. So, uh, so anyways, you should definitely, if, if you have the time, uh, and for the members, we will be opening up comms uh, so, so that you can hear it uh, get called. So stay tuned for that. All right, let's uh, go ahead and um, jump into the questions. Bill, what do we have? Our first one this morning comes from Jack Cannon in Termperley, Ukraine. And when you're traveling, he, or, uh, he asks, what is your go-to travel camera, not including phones? Uh, go ahead, Nigel. So when I'm taking still photography, I use my Fuji X-T4. And when I'm doing uh, this sort of stuff, I use a Logitech Brio. You go, Jeffrey. If I need something with optical zoom, I'm going to take my Sony AX700. And uh, for the little things like uh, NAB and CES, I've been doing this with the DJI Pocket 2 because it's really cool. I can actually do streaming from here. I can, and, and, and the best part, and I really love this, is I can do a one-on-one -on -one interview. I can have it pointed that way and then just hit a button here and the thing just turns around and I can talk and I can turn it back. And it's kind of a cool effect. And uh, uh, go ahead, Sky. I've been using the, the Lumix the, from Panasonic because it has the flip out monitor that allowed me to uh, be able to see in, in different angles and different directions. Also, it had the interchangeable lenses so that if I needed a wide angle lens with a small uh, ability to see in the dark, so to speak. And this was all previous to the Sony a, uh, A7S because that camera will see into the dark and also has the, the portable lens. Uh, go, ahead, lens. go ahead, John. I've got the little, uh, what is it? Uh, Canon G7X and it's got a little cage from uh, small rig it looks looks like a real big camera that just got shrunk in the wash but <laughs> it, i carry it around it's got a microphone input and hdmi out that's clean yeah so i i started using um i had a, a project in iraq a couple of years ago and i i took the a7s not the r but the s3 out with me and the advantage of that is that sensitivity rather than resolution and um i found that it was an incredibly great uh, travel camera. It takes great stills that, that are very high res and look very good. It also takes great video and it handles low light really, really well. So um, there's some idiosyncrasies to it, but I think that of all the cameras that I've taken into the field and I've taken the Blackmagic 6Ks and I've taken um, lots of cameras <laughs> into, into the field uh, and the, A7, uh, the A7S the a three has been the best camera that I've taken to a field, especially in a stressful situation, which sounds like you are. Thank you for your service. All right, next question. Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas comes up next and he says, what's your source for batteries that last? Double AA, A, triple A, and so forth. Amazon, name brand, how many do you buy at a time? Go ahead, Mitchell. I'm a sucker for uh, low hanging batteries at the grocery store or at the drugstore. The bigger the package, the better. I buy the, uh, the Ultra Duracells and I like uh, the Crunchy Skippy. <laughs> um, uh, go ahead, uh, Bill. I have settled on Eneloops, which I think are a division of Panasonic for rechargeables, and I've had nothing but really excellent work with them. They seem to always be consistently stable. Uh, the charging systems are easy to find. You can find uh, up to 16 bay chargers on Amazon. And when I was doing a lot of photography, I, the flashes burned through a lot of double A's. So uh, I probably have somewhere near 100 double A's in that kit uh, across a variety of flashes, and they've always been solid for me. Uh, go ahead, uh, Sky. And Mickey also recommended those rechargeables, probably the same brand, but they were sold by Ikea, and they're brilliant. They work great. They last long. Yeah, the ones that we, we've kind of uh, settled on are Pro Cells. These are the Pro versions of the Duracells. Um, and the Pro Cells we buy 24 at a time. Uh, they just they sell them as boxes. <laughs> you know, so we buy boxes of them at 24 at a time. And uh, the Pro Cells have been uh, really successful for us in that uh, realm. Um, next question. 
Ike Potter in Hanover, Germany. Is it possible to run two instances of the ATEM software control program on one PC to control two ATEM minis, which are on my LAN and in different rooms? So far, I'm using one PC and one laptop to do it. All right, go ahead, Mitchell. I have not tried it, but uh, they're IP-based, so you should be able to in theory. Yeah, we've absolutely done it with Macs, so I would imagine it would work in a PC, but we've definitely run um, more than one uh, ATEM on one Mac with different instances. I always feel like it's a bad idea, but we've done it and it's worked. Go ahead, Jeffrey. Yeah, you can actually do it on, on Windows as well. You have to, basically you install the first version, then you have to install the second version as administrator and put it into a different folder. And you got to make sure that the connection and the uh, ATEM Mini are in that different folder. Otherwise, it'll do crosstalk. Go ahead, Jeffrey. I'm sorry, I, I hit the wrong one. Um, next question. <laughs> next question comes to us from Sky Gleason here in the panel from Seattle, Washington. In my past, NAB was an event to see New Year and friends in the media industry. What's NAB's attraction to you for this year? Go ahead, Jeffrey. Finding new products. That's that's what I always go. I was. I'm also. I also consider myself the disruptor of NAB because I, you know, I'm not looking for the high end gear. I'm looking for things that you know the podcaster. The first year I went. I had somebody saying, I want you to find me the best for my podcast. So it was like radio uh, the desks that, that, that you would put into a radio station, microphones, software. And I decked out his, uh, his, his podcast gear for like, I think it was like $20,000 when it was all said and done. And he was really happy about it. Good, Bill. I'm not going this year, and it's the first time, other than, uh, of course, pandemic years that they canceled them, that I haven't gone. So I've been there for like 20 years. And what for me, it's a matter of thinking about whether NAB still has the same value. And I want to hear from all my friends and trusted people like Jeffrey and say, what was your experience like? And does it make sense for me to make the investment? Because it used to cost me two or $3,000 by the time I get everything done, except for those years that I was sponsored by somebody and going as a reporter or something. And so it it's a mind share, a time and a money investment. I want to make sure that whatever it becomes in this new era is giving me back as much as I'm putting into it. Next question. Next question. Jasmine Lee in Singapore says, has anyone experienced the pink screen of death on an N1 Mac mini? I've been able to recover after a system restore, but I'm wary of it being a sign of things to come. I have not. But I, that sounds horrible. Like usually a Mac doesn't do that kind of thing. And so if it does, you should, you should take it in while it's still under warranty. So, um, that's, that's a, that oftentimes is some kind of uh, firmware or not firmware, but chip issue. Uh, so when you see any, a Mac do anything like that, uh, and if it does it more than once, um, and even if it does it once, I would take it in like, while you're still under warranty, I would go in and have someone look at it because that sounds like a graphics card issue, or it could be a, a sub, uh, a hardware system uh, issue. So I, it's not, it's very unusual and there's no way to get a Mac into that state, um, without it. There's something wrong with the hardware. Go ahead, Bill. I just have experience though in the last maybe month, occasionally if I walk away from this system because I have something to go do and I come back to it later, I will see pink screens everywhere on my five monitors. I had never seen this before, but it, it starting to, and then I roll a mouse around and it undoes that state and comes back to normal. It seems like maybe they've built an additional screen saver in or something like that, that it's going to change colors. I had never seen that behavior before. I have seen it recently, but it's never been a lockout problem for for me. So make sure there isn't something benign going on before, you know, maybe this is a real problem and needs to be addressed, but that's been my experience. Go ahead, Mitchell. Never seen that specific uh, uh, screen of death, but I have seen freeze ups and I've noticed that it's more likely to happen on my older uh, uh, Mac pro uh, because it's got PC cards and things like that. And I think it has something to do with the sleep mode that the uh, computer goes into. Yeah, but anytime, it, and it's so unusual for, I mean, I've owned hundreds of Macs. It's so unusual for a Mac to do that, that, uh, you know, on a PC, I usually just go, I got to figure out what, what caused this. On a Mac, I'm like, I got to take this in. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't do those things. Um, next question. Uh, Sky Gleason's back again with, uh, what would you hope for that Apple would fix or add in a new release of Final Cut Pro at NAB? I, I think that um, I just will jump in and, and say that I, I think that most likely they would uh, add some features that would click quickly lo locate media that appears to be 
uh, once in a project using highlighted clip ranges or, or timeline index. Improve the clarity of speech by adjusting the le level of background noise using machine learning, which is pretty exciting. Optimizing playback and, and graphics performance for the M1 M Max and M1 Ultra and the new studio. Import ma uh, magic movie and storyboard projects. Adds Korean language for support. I think those would be that would be on the top of my list. And okay, that's reason, a great rehearsal. Do it again now with feeling. Yeah, exactly. It was released two days ago. Uh, go ahead, Nigel. Yeah, I, if there's anything else, I want to go back to one of those things that you just mentioned, which is I want them to do something that will allow them to say, if you don't have a studio, you're an idiot. Because <laughs> I think I think that's that's a real issue for them. Is they've got to think through the graphics. They've got to think through all those cores and make sure that the studio investors get the best return. Well, and I have to say that the, the I, with the updates there, um, it is so fast. I, I rendered something out of my out of motion and I thought that there was something wrong with the file. Well, the, the background, this background here rendered so fast. I literally, I hit it go. It said two and a half minutes. I looked back, I took, came back again and it was fa much faster than that. And I thought it broke the file and uh, it's screaming fast. This is in the studio. It's just, it's the optimization is amazing. Go ahead, Bill. I just have to say there was a keening wail of horror from all of my friends, a, su a subset of my friends, because for decades, the one thing they were able to save is, well, but they haven't done dupe detection yet. And they were all up in arms. It's been 10 years and they haven't done dupe detection and they did dupe detection now and they've got nothing to say. It's horrible. <laughs> yeah. So the um, anyway, there's a couple of things that I'm still missing, but I'll, I'll keep that <laughs> work on it. But but the uh, I do think that this mix of owning the hardware and owning the software and optimizing for it. Now, the, the interesting thing is it just really forces Adobe to do the same thing. And it forces I mean, Blackmagic is already kind of going down that path. It's much harder for Adobe because uh, Premiere and, and After Effects have so much technical debt that it's very hard for them to optimize and but it's but this will force them to because at some point it'll be too they'll be too fast to ignore if adobe doesn't um solve it so it's it's really that you really see the power of owning the software not so much that people are going to use it but it, that it forces everybody on the platform to step up because otherwise they're going to look um silly um so it's, it's really good for all users that that they that they're able to press that down go ahead bill and, and to, to buttress what you've just said, everybody's now talking about owning the full stack, hardware, software, and everything else. And that really is a value add because they don't have to wait for anybody else to do anything to yeah. optimize the interface between those two sides of the computing world. And I think it's going to give them significant advantages going forward. Yeah, I'm still waiting for them to buy affinity or pixelmator <laughs> i think they, they have you know and then and then push it i mean i think the pixelmator just came out with a new update too that uh, is really optimizing for for the uh, for the hardware next question nick bad in the uk is up next he says looking for a small camera uh mount looks like mixer recorder with more than one monitoring bus out he needs two separate mixes and he has a task dr 701 which doesn't quite do it I think that the mix pre would give you two different buses that you could mix out from. So I think that that might, I don't know if it'll do stereo, two stereo buses, but I think that the mix pre and especially the 10, and I believe that all the mix pre's are camera mountable, um, usually underneath the camera, not above the camera. So there's a screw mount that goes through all of them. Um, they're really designed as that. And the mix pre 10, of course, is way, you know, it's a lot of overkill in a lot of places, mix pre six. And I think the mix pre six may give you it, but you, it depends on whether you need mono or stereo go ahead mitchell yeah i agree with the mix pre uh doesn't zoom have a uh like a utility camera it mounted could. uh recorder it could i don't i don't know i have a lot of mix pre's <laughs> so so i don't i don't know what i don't know if zoom does they, they have a lot zoom i will say has lots and lots of recorders i just don't know if they're if they do a lot of individual busing and routing and and they may very very well do it um a lot of times they're Feature set is a little bit more anemic because they just don't have as much history in it as sound devices. But um, and the preamps and the sound devices are considerably better than Zoom. So, um, so uh, but Zoom may have another solution for you, and I just don't know enough about it to to know for sure. Go ahead, Jeffrey. Yeah, the Zoom H6, I believe, it did. And I'm trying to remember. I saw the Zoom 8 uh, a couple of years ago, and I'm pretty sure it had a mount, a pass through mount uh, on top and bottom. Uh, 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 next question. Eric Price in Kansas City, Missouri, uh, or maybe Kansas, said, did anyone see the Forbes article this week on uh, Blackmagic Design's Grant P Petty? Great insight into a culture at the top of the organization. I haven't um, haven't seen it. I'm, I, I, 
the um, it is interesting uh, that they talked about you know it's it's a privately held company so the fact that they finally told us that they um, that their profits just the profits not the sales but the profits um, were 115 million dollars uh, during the pandemic like selling those little ATEM minis <laughs> like you don't you know you don't you don't, you don't hear uh, uh, and you know the thing is is that to give you a sense of revenue. App, uh, black magic's not known for margins you know like they try to make things as inexpensive as they can so when they're when they're making that much profit it means they they're making a lot of revenue so it's a uh, that, that i think that was the thing that jumped out at me when i when i first looked at it there um but it's a it's a interesting um yeah definitely an interesting article so um uh, next question Nick Bat comes up again from the UK. I'm working on on a remote AWS Amazon Web Services Resolve workflow. How do people get footage into the cloud, and where do they store it? S3, BlackBlaze, Google Drive. Yeah, go ahead, uh, John. If you are wanting to store the the files in Amazon, have an Amazon workflow, S3 buckets would probably be your best bet. You're not going to pay for the data transfer back and forth. Every time you're exiting, you're paying a lot more for that data. So just be very mindful of that when you're considering a cloud workflow. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. It's getting better and better. For years, an upload was the longest process that I went through, and it was a real problem, so much so that I literally could not keep uh, footage for projects in the cloud at all. Starting with, I think, Transfer, which was the subroutine that um, – Frame.io put together, they started doing this thing where they, it was very much like uh, bit torrenting in the old days where they had multiple connections open and it automatically broke apart a file in the background and reassembled it at the end with security in between. That seemed to me to be a, a damn crack. And now we're seeing more and more of those similar kinds of services that really saturate whatever up and down bandwidth you have or can pay for and really makes files living in the cloud a potential i think this is still the early part of that but i can easily see a future coming where tossing files onto a big hard drive and letting them just fly up to the cloud overnight and then being able to work remotely is going to be kind of the standard operating procedure for all of us it's coming it just when it becomes affordable and when each of us can get into it is the the final remaining bricks to fall for me um, next question matt halverson excuse me Brookings, South Dakota says, what, is exact, what exactly is a native ISO on a camera, and why aren't all of them at 50 or 100? Some native ISOs are 800. <laughs> yeah, native ISOs are, are I mean, and I, I will say I'm not the expert in this area, um, but uh, native ISOs, my understanding of them anyway, is this is where the, it's the highest uh, IS, I, ISO before post sensor gain is added. So before you start to just add, you know, basically multiply so it's so imagine it's the it's the if you were thinking about audio and you're recording at 30 db or whatever that's your source signal everything after that is just it's just going to you're just scaling up and going into the noise floor of what you're doing and so if you have you know so that's the that's where where that is so it, it it's um and i the dual iso thing is basically it's optimized for two different isos so like for instance um, the black magic ISO, the black magic, I think is at 430, is it 430, 200 or 800 and 3,200 at 3,200, like, so 2,800 is actually grainier than 3,200 when you go into it, because, because what's happening is, is you're now just adding math and you're saying, well, I see a signal. Cause you want to, you don't want to think about a, a sensor capturing color. It's just capturing light. You know, it's got basically, it's got, um, Bill, your mic's open. It's got, um, uh, uh, basically you have a bunch of little, you know, sense on the sensor, you have a bunch of things that are going to, going to hear red or see red, green, or blue. They're not on top of each other. They're literally all next to each other. That's why we have to add sharpening is because every image is just a little blurry because of that. And so what happens is, is that what they're measuring, those photo sites is just like, like how much green did I get? But it's like zero to one, <laughs> you know, like it's just, so it's, it's, you know, if it's not very green, it sees 0.1 or 0.01 or whatever that is. And what happens is that's what's coming out of that sensor. When you add gain, you're just multiplying, you know, to the, you know, to that, to that number. Um, and you're, you're pushing that number up. And so, so the, the, um, what the native ISO is, is what it's actually measuring, you know, into there. Now I will say that, that if you, you can go below the native and you're going to get, um, you are going to get a little less grain too. I mean, it just, it definitely gets smoother. We're running a, a lot of our cameras right now on the stage at negative two, negative four dB. And it looks pretty smooth on oh, these are these are on little 6k, 6K cameras and so um 
Uh, so that's why. And the reason why that they don't put it on all the cameras is that, that it's hard. <laughs> like it's hard, it's expensive and hard to have a low ISO. Um, and the reason for that is that Photosite can only, you know, can only get to that ISO, you know, can only um, sense so much stuff on the Photosite. So as we add resolution, it actually creates more errata where you get more things that cause that grain is because um, because it's the the photo sites that sit on top of that sensor are getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. We're using a low light camera in one of our um, in one of our projects right now, and it goes up to an ISO of about I think it's about a couple hundred thousand. But it's a super super thirty five sensor. This is the Canon ME twenty super thirty five sensor, but only ten eighty p. And by doing that, they have much larger photo sites. And we may test the ME twenty soon, which is a full size sensor, but only 1080p. And that's got massive um, photo sites, which means you can go, you can gain it up essentially up into the 4 million ISO range, which is kind of amazing. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. All of what Alex said, that was a really good kind of general thing. Um, and the practical value of this is that often you find yourself into a situation where you would like to add more light into a scene, but it's just impractical. Maybe you're shooting a big night scene and you can't bring in huge lights to bring up the levels so that they're acceptable. So uh, what Alex was explaining in terms of as you amplify dark signals coming through the lens, you get a lot of noise and that noise can be very ugly to look at. So... Uh, the native ISO in the camera is where it's set, but the answer is you can either do electronic gain or you can add more light into the scene, and sometimes that's just impractical. So the cameras allow us to cheat, and dual native ISO, is a, exactly as he explained, it'll be as little noise as is physic, uh, it, it, possible in the terms of physics at one ISO, and then above it, it will do its best to also eliminate noise organically at that one with a different amplification circuit added to it. But in between, you're kind of more in trouble. So if you can stay on one of the two dual native ISOs, and especially if you can stay on the lower one, you will always get the less noisy, better results out of your camera. One thing that we, what we're going to see kind of adjust for this is basically a lot of computational photography. So we're seeing a lot of that computational photography right now inside of uh, phones. So iPhones and Samsung primarily, those are the two big ones that are doing enormous amounts of work where if you, if you take a picture of an iPhone in low light, you'll notice it looks grainy for a second and then it immediately smooths out. And that's the computational photography. When, so what goes on to your photo roll a second later is actually a better image than what you saw live when you, take, when you took the picture. And that's because Apple's processing it with, you know, in the post to pull detail out, get rid of grain, and using a lot of it, uh, machine learning to, to basically pull that in and, and make it better. We haven't seen that as much in uh, still cameras uh, on the bigger sensors or video cameras. And the reason is those companies don't have enough money <laughs> to do that. It's really hard. Like these are really hard problems to, to solve. And there's only a handful of companies that have the R&D budget to push them forward. Um, I think that as we move forward, um, we will see eventually these larger chips get the computational photography they need. But if you, there's a lot of software out there also that can do a pretty good job of removing some of that like neat um, uh, is a filter that we use to pull it out. And it does a pretty good job. Um, go ahead, John. So does a company like Sony start really investing like all their phone software into their camera software going forward? Is that to be, sort to of be honest, of that? It, it could, it, it, you know, I think they, they could do that. The problem really is, is that the computational uh, challenges for a larger chip are higher too. So it's, it's harder to do. And again, Sony doesn't have the kind of money that Apple and Samsung have. I mean, that's for R and D. I mean, Apple has, I don't know what it is now, but on 60 minutes years ago, they said that they had 200 engineers working on the camera, like just the camera. <laughs> so, um, there's probably more, more now because the number one thing that separate, that people make a decision about on their phones is the camera. It's not the size, it's not the color, it's not the battery, it's not anything else other than the camera. And so you're just gonna keep on seeing this incredible arms race which benefits all of us. Um, next question. Mac Halverson in Brookings, South Dakota says, when setting up video lighting for an interview, do you turn the lights power up so that you have a lower ISO on your camera or do you keep the power low and turn the ISO up? Uh, go ahead, Sky. Well, I think that conversation was pretty well uh, discussed just now with between Alex and, and Bill, but I was going to recommend also Shane Perlbutt as a director of photography and his teaching me about lighting. And I'll, I'll point you to Bill Davis's image because what Shane taught me was actually you need more light, not less. 
and you would want to shape it and diffuse it. And so consequently, as they were talking about the noise and you're regarding your question about an interview and your ISO, Bill referred to as noise. If noise is a, a style that you want, I know there's an entire movie, you know, Brother War Out There, what, that was a sepia that had an old timey feel to it. And so if noise is what you want, then yeah, you want a really high ISO and lots of pixels. Uh, I mean, you know, blocks and things like that, but maybe that's not what you want. And I, I point to Bill Davis's image because he's got a very sharp light on his face that you can see, but he also has a very specific light back behind and it's very shaped. And he also has chosen colors to do certain things to, to show. He's also got a little, little desk lamp over there. So he's balanced things out. So I think the word balance is what you're, you're, uh, is what I'm going to bring to the, the question as well. What is it that you want your audience to be seeing and what is the feel you want them to, you know, to, to support that central focus? Go ahead, Jeffrey. For me, it's, uh, it's all about uh, how the room's set up. So like in the studio here, I, I have a hard time uh, with lights in front of my face. So I try to keep a good balance as best as possible. And I know I don't always uh, uh, strive on that for, for certain things, but if I could raise these lights up at least two feet higher, that would be a, a lot different. As for uh, doing uh, video for somebody else, it really depends on how they feel on that. If they have uh, if they have problems uh, looking into the camera and they see the lights like I do in the peripheral uh, and, and it's just too bothersome, I will turn the light down for them or I'll try and figure out how to bounce light so they'll still get the shot. But, uh, and, and then of course, gain up the ISO uh, and then hope for the best sometimes. Go ahead, Bill. And it also, and I think uh, Sky was dancing around this beautifully. It has to do with the emotional feeling that you want your picture to have with people. Uh, I'm looking on the panel right now, and I'm looking particularly at Nigel versus Kenneth Jones's picture. Nigel is a pretty high key look. His background is pretty well lit, and so is he, obviously. In Kenneth's case, he's well lit, but he's let his background go to deep darkness. And those give you two different feelings. So when lighting an interview, uh, to me, it's a matter of figuring out what's the subject, what's the person. Person I'm shooting and what is the emotional thing that I want to get if there is an emotional content let's say it's somebody who's experienced loss or something like that and we're trying to help people recover from loss a darker background a moodier set with the person lit well in front of that becomes a maybe a better choice than to light them up like it's an ad for a product and you want everything to look clean and shiny um, so there's an emotional mood that that directors of photographer and ph photography and videographers pay great attention to. Now, the trick is if you're doing what's called low key lighting, typically that dark background and the highlighted subject is called low key lighting, as opposed to high key lighting where everything is pretty bright in the frame. If you're dealing with that and you want to do low key, the the big trick is to get enough light into your background so that you don't get noise and grain. Mm -hmm. So sometimes setting up the background properly so that you get enough light there and then adding enough light so that you can light your subject, but iris down so that you still have enough light coming off that background so it doesn't become a murky mess. This is the art of lighting, and it takes a while of practice to, to lock down. Uh, rule of thumb is that you uh, want to light for 400 ISO. <laughs> you just set your camera to 400 ISO and make all the things that were said earlier are, are, the, um, are definitely good points as far as shaping and coloring the lights. Set your camera to 400 ISO and make sure that looking through scopes, you're seeing a proper exposed image. That means that your high points are about 90% and your black points are about 5%. Um, and so you can do everything you want it to make it feel like that, but for it to come out the way you want it, and you can always make it darker later, but you can't make it brighter and not to screw it up. So you know, set your ca camera to 400 ISO and then do all the things that we everyone just talked about to get the feel and the look that you want. Um, but uh, to get the exposure, it needs to be properly exposed. These are for interviews. I'm not talking about filmmaking. I'm not talking about, you know, other things that you may want to do different things, but for interviews, you need to have the person properly exposed at 400 ISO. Um, and you just want to have enough light to do that. Next question. Jeffrey Powers in Madison, Wisconsin comes up next here on the panel. Best travel lock for a Mac mini M1 since there's no Kensington option. I don't know of one other than putting it in a sonnet rack, which sometimes feels like a lock because it takes you like an hour to get it back out again. Uh, go ahead, John. MacLocks.com. They have a case that you can put it in that's compatible with Kensington locks. I'll post a link in uh, the Discord. Or I'm sorry, okay. the uh, Makana. And yeah, next question. 
Vic Hernandez in Springfield, Missouri is up next. Follow-up, can Filmic Remote on an Android control Filmic Pro on an iPhone? I don't know. You know, I, I um, my, my, my request on those is to ask them early. So what happens is I see these questions about between 6 and 6.30 or 6, 6.40 or so. And, um, and if you don't ask them before, then I don't have time to prep. <laughs> so, and I think I was looking for, I, 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 as soon as I saw that question a little bit later during the show, I was like, oh, I don't even know where my Android phone is. So, I, but in the morning I would have, would have found it. So this is good for our producers is to ask those questions, try to ask them. You can ask them the night before, definitely ask them first thing in the morning if you can, um, before 630, because when I disappear and the, everyone does mic checks, a lot of times I'm going through the questions, trying to figure out answers. And so if you ask them before 630 or before 640 at the latest, um, a lot of times some of us can look at them. Uh, go ahead, Jeffrey. Actually, Vic asked, asked this question yesterday and I, know, I but, said, I have an Android right over there. And my job was to yeah. figure this out. And we got into, I got in a whole bunch of meetings and then I had to book all my NAB stuff and it just it, didn't happen. So ask again, again tomorrow. But ask again tomorrow, but ask before 630. So because the, the thing is, is that after seven, I'm not conscious. I'm not conscious to it between shows. I have a lot of work to do. So, um, but if you ask it again, I'll, I'll, I think I can get my, my, uh, my hydrogen out somewhere and try to load it up. Uh, but otherwise we'll, we'll, we'll also ping Jeffrey at 630 going, go download it. And Jeffrey's downloading it right now. I know he is, isn't he? Isn't he? He's downloading it right now. All right, next question. Next one comes to us from Douglas Carmichael, and he says, how do you streamline programming workflows when working with large lighting systems? Do you assign instruments to groups? You know, that is a great question for Tlaloc. <laughs> Go ahead, Bill. Well, I've got to believe that all the major lighting software allows groups because they allow scenes. I mean, it is, it, they don't reset every light when they're changing a scene from a stage play from a low key dismal mm -hmm. thing around a campfire to a big thing. They have a pre-programmed set of cues for the next scene. And when they execute next scene, all those things happen. I will say he even, even here on my desk with my little lighting system, I have one uh, switch bank that controls my key lights and my desk lights because I turn them on and off depending on whether I'm doing the show here or something smaller with just talking to a friend. But all the lights that light my background up are on a single switch because that particular lighting controller has a master switch. If I can do that with this little thing, you can be pretty sure that any of the larger lighting systems have not just that simple capability, but tons more ability to do scenes and sub scenes and groupings and assign lights into things. There's just no reason they wouldn't have developed that over the course of time. Go ahead, John. I typically don't assign anything into a group. I will leverage scenes or different things like that to be able to uh, copy things over that I want to stay consistently be beyond. Um, individual light control is very important when you're doing like lighting design. And so I never want to like just move all lights up unless I'm talking about like maybe the house lights. I'll move those up all at the same time when I'm doing like house worship or band stuff. Next question. Matt Halverson in Brookings, South Dakota, regarding the reality scan app that Alex showed yesterday. How do you share the finished product with people to see? Is it hosted on the Epic Games website? I'm thinking about scanning classrooms to show off at a university. Yeah, so what you do is you, you when you use that app, it automatically up, uploads to Sketchfab. Sketchfab is what's actually processing the images. So it takes the raw data that comes from uh, from the app. And what the app is doing, to my understanding, looking at it, is that it is gathering all those images. It's doing a very low resolution version of the photogrammetry to give you a sense um, of what's working and not working. It's probably using, it's just so it can do it in real time. So in real time, it's constantly showing you, oh, here's some boxes and here are things that you that, that we're getting out of it. And with some, and it, so it's figuring that out and that keeps it you know, light and easy to use in the field. Then it takes all the high res images with the depth data. It uploads it to Sketchfab. Sketchfab then processes it into it and makes it available. From there, you can download it from Sketchfab. Sketchfab is, we've used that for years for other things. And so you can absolutely just download it as an OBJ with textures or many other file formats. So that's that's how you get it back out again. Next question. Harry Higgins and uh, Huggins, it looks like, and no city given, trying to figure out how to record the laughter of a virtual audience for a news quiz style podcast without having 100 plus participants in a meeting. Is it possible to funnel them into a single virtual audience square? I'll go ahead, uh, Bill. 
just the sound portion of it, I would send you to any of the sound effects libraries, the good ones, and I use Sound Dogs a lot, but there are others out there. Uh, we'll have all sorts of audiences and all sorts of uh, virtual responses. So you'll be able to grab a laughter thing, probably multiple laughter tracks and use that. So you don't have to do it practically in, in there. Um, you certainly could, I guess. Uh, figure out a way to re record a meeting and then have a lot of people show up. But typically, that's my first thing. And the, the nice thing about those things is that you're licensing them, so you're not going to get any trouble using that sound effect. I have to say, unless it's a joke, I mean, like not, not a joke like a comedian, but unless I'm making fun of it, of the actual process that I've watched so little TV with laugh tracks in the last decade that I can't stand them. Like I literally can't listen to them anymore um, because it just, it's just like this whack in the face. And it's just because I didn't listen to them for a long time, you know, and now they sound just come so artificial. I think that, you know, I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, I really do think our society is moving more and more. I think part of it's TikTok and part of it's YouTube are moving more and more towards the, a, a quest for authenticity over, um, you know, design and like, let's add this thing in because we have to add it and people would rather it be an authentic experience over the, over the, the, the crutches that we used in the past. Go ahead, Sky. Well, I've been speaking directly into the crutches that you're talking about because yes, for the long history, there is a people, there's an entire industry called the laugher and they were brought in to bring in that, that ambience or that uh, attitude of a show that was produced and fixed in, in fixed in post um, is now moving forward. You may not want to do that, but there are those options as Bill mentioned. One thing to know is that if you put everybody on headphones and absolutely everybody's on headphones, um, I do believe Zoom, I know it worked with Hangouts and I do believe Zoom works this way. We really haven't done a hard test of it. I believe it will remain in full duplex. So if it doesn't hear anything, it will, it will allow um, a lot of folks all to kind of mix and match through there. So it may bounce between them. I think it only does three tracks at a time, but, um, but it, it will, um, you'll get a lot better audio from a lot more people if absolutely everybody is on headphones, but they all have to be um, there to do that. Um, next question. Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana is up next. He says, just received my DJI mic. What would you do to compare the quality to a Rode Go 2? My plan was to use my iPad to record both and bring them back into my audio editor to compare waveforms. Is there a better way? I go ahead, Sky. I am not an audio person, but we're, because I use these exact same pieces of equipment, my option would be to make sure that the chain is consistent between the two and also what is the final audio system that is going to be heard from so keep it inside your if you're going to be recording in the future with your ipad then absolutely use your ipad but i wouldn't necessarily compare the waveforms i would compare it on different speakers and traditionally in audio sweetening systems i've uh, uh locations i've been in suites the engineer will have the cheapest smallest little audio speaker possible as the final it might be coming out of a radio car speaker and so that was a, a testing of a thing always test it consistently with where you yeah. are going to be using in the future go ahead bill also, you know, you're kind of dabbling into the area of forensic audio, which is really slicing and dicing down into the deep inner workings of captured waveforms and things like that. It, it's important to know what you're testing for and what to look for there. And I'll give you a simple example. I did a gig uh, decades ago where I just heard in my headphones before that there was a deep note at a moment in the piece of music I was using. And this was for a... Uh, a group of people who rehabilitated wildlife. And for some reason, when I heard that, I thought, let me make sure when they play it back in the actual room um, that they have speakers good enough. And I went to the location and they, oh yeah, we normally have the bass rolled off, but we'll roll it back up. And I heard later that, that at the moment that eagle was released and that bass note hit, everybody leaped up in the audience to applause. The reason I'm saying that is because if I hadn't understood that there was low frequency content in that, because I had been working on a system that veiled that piece of information from me, the audience wouldn't have had that moment that really spoke mm -hmm. to them. So. When you're looking at audio, when you're saying, does this mic equal that mic, understanding what all mics are completely potential for and understanding, you know, maybe it sounds great and maybe this one sounds exactly light, but when you unveil high end information or low end information through scopes and things like that, maybe there are things there that you're really not paying attention to that are real. 
and that if you pay attention to them, if you understand how to dissect the audio, you will be able to start seeing things like compression on a scope. But you might not be able to see that if you haven't experienced much in that area. So all, all I'm saying is just be be specific and, and learn the craft as well as you can. Read as much as you can because the professionals who do this stuff know a lot about what to look for to right. figure out whether it's equal. Yeah, so the... Um uh, what I would do first is I would actually clip on, uh, clip the two mics onto me because both of them have internal mics. So you're going to test those uh, and then say a couple things. I would do it outside so that it picks up some noise around and you can see how directional those things are. Um, the second thing that I would do that would be a little bit more intense would be they all they all have mic inputs as well. Um, I would I would work on getting a mic output and this will take a little bit of like figuring out, but basically take a, a source, a source and play it out as an input to both mics at the same time. And then I would compare those to the source. So it would tell you what they're doing as far as their processing goes. Um, and then the other thing that I would do is do them at distance. So I clip them both, record it on, on the far end and walk away and see walking through the same area, where do they start to break up um, to, to, as far as just isolating exactly what's wrong uh, or what's not wrong, but what's different but between their performance as well as the preamp within that system, as well as the microphones that are in their system. There, next question. David Barton in Memphis, Tennessee is up next. Has anyone used the Presonus Revelator series? They have some built-in processing that could be useful for home kits. I have one right here. <laughs> I have not had time to dig into it, so I got it. And, uh, and I have it here, and I've been uh, trying to play with it just as another. This is a, we're looking at this as a potential for us to send out in kits. Um, because we can open that app and then do a lot of work on someone's mic um, uh, to to make that work. And so we we have one in that's ready to be tested, but uh, it has been stalled a couple times on our production because we have kits that work right now with the Mixpres. And so, um, but we look we're looking, but the problem is the Mixpres we don't have as much control remotely of digging into the Mixpre to make make adjustments to compression and so on and so forth. And so that's why we're we are looking at these ones um, as a solution for that. Um, next question. Chad Lafarge in Columbia, Missouri says, I recently bought two Mac Mini M1s. Is an upcoming announcement going to make me sad for not waiting? <laughs> Go ahead, Nigel. Well, if they are doing what you bought them to do, then be happy that they are doing what you bought them to do. If you are worried they're about to be replaced with an M2, I think it's hard to know exactly. I don't know, at least. What I know is we're closer to them being replaced than we were to them being announced. <laughs> Go ahead, Jeffrey. Uh, yeah, so uh, apparently um, Apple has been doing uh, 99 to $140 discounts on their Mac Mini M1s, the 256 gig models. So maybe that's where that's coming from. There's going to be no announcements until WWDC. Uh, M2 might be in, in the future, but I think it's just going to be like two years ago when they announced the M1. You'll be able to get a production unit that you'll have to send back to do all the testing with the new uh, iOS uh, or, uh, yeah, the, the new Mac OS. And, uh, and then I think on M2, if it comes out, it'll be as early as November. But uh, I think you're fine right now. Good, Chris. As always, Chad, if somebody tells you something about an Apple announcement, they don't know. If they know, they won't tell you. And we are not qualified to speak to your mental health. <laughs> The um, uh, I think that you know I have now bought um, I think seven or eight of the M ones, um, and so and I'm still happy and I'll still be happy after they announce the next ones. I'll just buy more of the M twos, so I'm not too worried about it. They're so inexpensive compared to everything else that I buy. You know, like all the other computers that we buy, that that I just find that I I buy the you know I I buy things knowing that that I'll amortize them quickly or I don't buy them. You know, like and they're, they're going to be worth their value as soon as I almost as soon as I purchase them, uh, or otherwise I just keep waiting. Um, next question. Uh, Nick Bat is up next, and I think I understand this. How do you connect audio I.O., I believe it should be, to a gimbal mounting phone rig to stop the cable from interfering with stabilization? Um, yeah, so I don't think that it, there's not a lot of good ways to do that. There's two two things. If, it's, if you're using a, a phone, a mounted phone, a gimbal for a phone, then you're going to have problems because it's so lightweight. Now, if you give it something bigger, like the RCS2, um, you know, or a, or, a, or a Ronin or something like that, I know it sounds crazy, but if you put those larger ones, like the RCS2, that's the D DJI, um, has got a lot more uh, oomph to it, and the phone is nothing, you know, from it. So that now you can add wires to it, and it's just going to do what it needs to do. So you just need a more powerful one, and that one is only. I mean, that's it is more expensive. It's five hundred dollars. There's a 
there's a pro version that's like a thousand dollars that's there. I'm really looking at the pro version because of the remote control capabilities of it. Um, but the uh, but those I would get a beefier gimbal and um, use it. The other option I would say is to use something like um, so. What I've been doing to get into things that don't let you have an external audio input is to use the Bluetooth pill for, that that basically is from Audinate. So you have you have Dante into it, and then it's Bluetooth, and it looks like a Bluetooth headset. And the reason that that's important is that any app that is looking for Bluetooth headsets, that's in the system. It just says rather than trying to find an external input, I just say just just grab that Bluetooth app, um, that Bluetooth headset. But that Bluetooth headset is my entire production pipeline going to be a Dante into this little pill that's Poe. Uh, go ahead, Chris. So, so your answer is Dante into a iPhone on a gimbal. Is, oh yeah, is that, is that what I'm hearing? Oh yeah. Okay. First that's of all, you can never go far. You can never go too far. <laughs> so, no, so, uh, so the thing is, is that, but, but that's that at, at, at a close range, it will absolutely work. When, when I did it for Clubhouse, you know, Clubhouse didn't let you use external input for a long right. time. People, the first thing people would ask is, uh, what, what headset are you using? I'm, of course I'm using this mic with Dante into, into Clubhouse. And you just, it was like, it was literally like just driving this truck that's like six times bigger than everybody else through the street. Um, so uh, like with the big wheels, you know. <laughs> so anyway, so, so it's, it's, it, it works really well. So what I was going to say is, it, it's interesting, you know, Apple for several years now has been on this kick of wireless, you know, wireless mics, wireless keyboard, wireless charging on a phone. And, you know, they have, these, you know, these stupid things that always interrupt with your computer. I think you can get decent sound out of these if it's only going one direction. And I have to believe that there is a future where Apple will provide a wireless audio system into their phones. Although, you know, most of the stuff is geared very consumer-y, but... I, I think there's a future in that. And, you know, they keep, you know, shot on iPhone. They, they want all this professional-ish type of stuff being done on a phone. I think they'll, eventually they'll do something. But the problem yeah, is, right is that now, when you go professional, a lot of times you just go to, um, you know, basically recording audio separately and record, like when you say, I want to do something for post, you just record the audio separately and use use the uh, NAT sound to, to yeah. sync it back up. So our friend Jack, who has his... Uh, overland discord channel um he uh he went out and bought a, a 6k and bought some stuff and and the lift of getting into that next level of stuff it was just it was a headache for him he it was like ah, i don't want to i think he's traded off the camera he, he he traded for a much simpler camera but he's actually decided to use um just his phone he got, he's like this is fine i'm gonna just shoot my videos on my phone because he does like a he'll do a thing where he'll do like a walking tour mm -hmm. around somebody's four-wheel drive rig and he just wants oh, like, cool tires cool lights cool lockers whatever um lights before lockers and um he's using the i'm i'm looking over at something that's on a shelf sorry uh the go the go uh road the road go to and he and he has the little cable and so he's got the little tiny receiver, which is about this size, but it's black, little tiny cable right into the phone. And then he's got the two road mics. And is it so on a gimbal? Like, oh, uh, I think he can. That's the question. But the, the problem is, is that as soon as you tie, I mean, I don't know, as soon as you tie it to a gimbal, a phone gimbal, it immediately stops working. Like it just falls over. Yeah, well, that's because the phone gimbal is so balanced for that. So maybe, right. like you said, a slightly bigger gimbal. I, yeah. You could just you could velcro this thing to the back of the phone, and it would be mm -hmm. an insignificant uh, weight it, add. It 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 won't be for a for an iPhone rig. For an iPhone gimbal, it won't work. For a larger gimbal, it will work. Like you know, and you can get cheaper ones. The you know, there's Fengwei or whatever Gen makes a these. Gimbal but mounted. you just need a. What you need is an SLR gimbal for the phone. Which can be two or three hundred dollars, or if you get the DJI one, it's like five hundred dollars. Um, yeah, go Bill, real quick. Yeah, I've been able to do that using the Ceramonic because it has a small pigtail here. I use it on a gimbal with my iPhone, the DJI uh, Osmo 4, and I even actually am able to leave the case here. In fact, I have two little score marks because there's a clamp that it uses, and I can run this with the audio attached. Now, the only time I get in trouble is if the whole system flips around, it'll get to the, to the end. It doesn't hurt anything, and I have to reset it, but... 
they're, these gimbals are getting better, even the small ones, and they're getting more powerful, and we're getting close to being able to have solutions. I'm really surprised, really quickly, that uh, they haven't done more with Bluetooth in the Apple ecosystem to allow Bluetooth into the phone and make it work. I know it's not full spo- uh, spectrum sound, but they should be able to do that better. Well, they do that now. Like that's that's what I was talking about. <laughs> like, but I think Filmic they, Pro is the only thing I've seen that actually has a reliable Bluetooth connection. Maybe I'm behind. It's just the times. all you do is, but it's it, it's anything that has a anything that looks at the system audio because the system audio is Bluetooth. So the the thing is is that you just tell it this are this is my headset. Well, that's what what with mine it just says this is my Bluetooth headset. Anything that shows up as a Bluetooth headset is all that matters. Yeah, that, that's what Nigel has. I have well. to investigate that more. Thanks. Yeah, it works really well. Like it's it's a magical little little device. Um, next question. Gabriel Ung in Malaysia says, I noticed mixed results with long HDMI cable lengths and different inputs on the A10 mini. 10 meter long cable works well with inputs one to three, but no signals when plugged into five to eight. Any reasons or ideas why this might be? Thanks. Go ahead, Mitchell, real quick. It might be your testing procedure. Uh, things are weird when you go into input one on your uh, ATEM. Yeah, it doesn't say he was, um, he was talking about the, the yeah, the one through three though is weird, uh, is, is an odd thing. Um, yeah, I, I find that to be odd. Go ahead, uh, go ahead, John, quick, real quick. Do the, um, the, the ATEM, uh, I'm sorry, to, beyond the first four inputs, is there different scalers or different actual hardware differences beyond that? The only thing I know of is that there's a distinct difference between one and the rest of them because it's designed for low latency gaming. Um, so it, and it also defines oftentimes, if you leave it on default, it'll define the resolution of all the other inputs. If you plug whatever's into one, will define the inputs for everything else. Uh, unless you force it. Um, so it's the only one that I know that's special is one. So if you said if there's something different between one and the other ones, then that makes sense. If it, one through three is the part that is, I don't have an answer for. Next question. Next one comes to us from Chris Widener of Lafayette, Indiana. He says, has anyone tried the Hommel, H-O-M-Y-L, motorized panoramic tripod head? It's got a link there. The YRW9 was recommended uh, for a Mevo camera since it has remote control for movement. I have not tested this one. I, there's one that's a little bit more expensive called a Best Core that I have tested. And what I find is that you can get it, a camera to move there. It's hard to be precise and it's definitely not smooth. So you just, you don't want to, you're not going to do panning shots with it. But if you want to get to a place um, with a remote control, uh, it does do the thing. Um, but it it's getting exactly what you want. And any any kind of fine move, movement movements on most of these smaller ones has not been um, something that we've experienced. But I haven't tested this one. Maybe they did something way better for $99, but anything under about uh, a couple, you know, $500, I haven't found anything smooth. Um, the one, that's why, again, why we're looking at these DGI um, uh, heads that, that you walk around with because they've got a remote control system. And so a lot of us are looking at those to make those our pan tilt zoom heads because we know that DGI knows how to do this well. Um, next question. Alan Scott of Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada says, I'm starting to live stream to YouTube and I noticed that the stream health shows no data if I fade to black for a second or so. Is this normal? It shouldn't say no data. It should say bad data. <laughs> so if you, uh, if you, if, so the, the, the no data means I'm not getting any bits. Um, and maybe it, that's the case. Usually what happens is if you play a still into YouTube, it thinks it's not getting enough bandwidth. It doesn't, it's not getting the bit rate that it expects because it's expecting a certain threshold to say that I'm getting video um, and it's not getting that threshold um, effectively. And so, um, so that's the, that, so I, I would say that you're probably the, the, the issue that you have right now is that it, you're pushing something out that is not notated. It's not going to hurt anything. Like YouTube has tons of uh, error messages that don't mean anything. So, I, you know, at some point, I think that, I mean, it just, it, we, we, we look at a lot of these, if we know that we're getting, now, sometimes it does mean something, but very rarely does it mean anything. Uh, uh, you get a lot of uh, these little fling, flinging these little errors because, you know, the math is just not what it expects. But uh, as soon as you move something again, it should, it, and it's also why a lot of us will, uh, with our, um, our slates, you'll notice that like the slate before the show, the countdown clock, it's one of the reasons there's a whole bunch of things moving. It's, it, I'm 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 actually exercising YouTube so I don't get that error. That's that's part of it. It also allows us to know that it's actually working and and everything's going the way it should. Go ahead, Jeffrey. The only other time to be worried about it is if you have that little box check that says uh, uh, stop the stream when uh, when you don't get any more data or if if you feel that the stream gets stopped. Otherwise, 
uh, YouTube will just sit there for a few hours before it ends and he types the stream. So yeah, it used to be that YouTube was very flick. <laughs> very flinchy about that so it would lose data for just a couple seconds and it would go okay the, the, the stream isn't working it would just close um and so a lot of us you know uh agitated until we didn't didn't have that happen anymore because and so now it's probably one of the most robust it'll just sit there and just wait for you to come back up uh next question uh, Douglas Carmichael, if I were to pursue the iOS development path, code with Chris and so forth, how do you demonstrate your knowledge to clients and employers? Uh, make an app. Make a good app. Make an app that people like. Make an app that looks nice. Make an app that works well. I mean, it's just make an app. And the first one you make won't be any of those things, but make them. <laughs> so, uh, and publish it to the store. Like, even if t 10 people download it, go through the entire process of publishing um, you know, uh, iOS app, an iOS app to the thing. It's just do it. Um, and it's, uh, you know, I think a lot of people think about it. They try to figure out how they're going to do all those things, but you just want to, you know, I think that if you just follow the code with, with Chris tutorials, like he has you making apps, um, make apps, make apps, make apps, and then start thinking of your own and make your own and, and, and hack through them and, and break them and be frustrated and, you know, go down dead ends and everything else. Um, I have not coded recently. I, I have a, I've actually played with code with Chris. That's why I know it really well. Um, it, it, but I just run out of time because I'm, I have a lot of things going on. And, uh, uh, but what I will say is when I, the, the thing that, that made the biggest difference for me when I was a kid was that I would, um, I built things the way, it's funny, I built things the way my uncle built furniture. <laughs> so my uncle built furniture and he would build it three times. Like he would always build everything three times in his shop and he would build, he'd build it once. And he'd look at it and he wouldn't like oh, this, 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 and he'd throw it away. Then he'd build it again and, he, and he, it was much closer because he had planned it and everything else and he'd throw that one away. And I'm literally just burn it or put it in something else. I mean, he would throw like, like little rocking chair, little kids rocking chairs into the fire. Like, like that was the last version of it. He was very uh, un, unapologetic. And then he would sit down and draw it all out and everything else, knowing what he knew from those first two, he'd build it. And I, I, I learned to code that way. And so what I would do is I would write, I would just hack something out. Like, no, no, no comments, no, nothing, lots of go-tos. Like, I don't know what to do with this. I'm just going to do a go-to, um, you know, and just kind of throw things together. And then I just throw all that code. Not, I didn't throw some of the code out, throw all the code out. <laughs> and then I did it. I wrote it again with the knowledge that I had there. And then I sat down and I did a flow chart. Like, you know, like this is exactly how this is, needs to work. And I wrote it and it was um, my, my, and then I commented everything and, you know, I took time because now I'm not commenting things that I'm going to throw away. I'm commenting things that are there. And um, it was really, it was, it was a good approach. I, I do 3D modeling that way. I do lots of things that way. So you just want to iterate. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, with the price of wood now, your uncle may work a different way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was really cheap back then. It was, it was uh, yeah, price of wood. I might, I might suggest not making furniture that way anymore. Uh, next question. Last question for the first hour. Eduardo Augustine in Panama. Pennsylvania says, or Panama, just Panama. How do you replicate a super source without ATEM Mini Extreme ISO? My ATEM died on me and I've been trying OBS, but it's just troublesome. Any suggestions? Uh, go ahead, Chris. I'd be super interested, Eduardo, in hearing what happened to your ATEM. Uh, if you could send me a message in Discord. Uh, be careful with OBS. You could do it. It's, it's about creating, well, first of all, you have to get all those uh, HDMI inputs that were going into your extreme into OBS. Uh, not an insignificant lift. You're going to have to get some boxes and bears on my, and then it's making scenes and and uh, bringing uh, br dragging multiple sources into that scene and scale. It, it's a mess. Get your ATEM fixed. Go ahead, uh, Mitchell. I had a similar situation happen to me some time ago, and I had uh, previously created um, an in um, in registration border for all the super sources in Photoshop and then brought it in so that I could place a border because I didn't have the number of channels and I didn't have mix effects. And it just so happened I saved that border and I was able to recreate the entire super set, uh, uh, super source uh, exactly uh, pixel perfect uh, in After Effects and recreate the effect. Go ahead, Nigel. If you are really at a pinch and you're on a Mac, I find Ecamm works very well. Just bring the guests in using the interview function, you'll get something fast. And Jeffrey? 
Yeah, OBS on a Mac is not a good idea. You can try NDI bringing them in, and uh, and if you if you have that ability, uh, otherwise I would use a deck link card going into a Sonnet box because if you start plugging in uh, USB HDMI converters, you're going to start to saturate your bus and have a whole bunch of new problems with the deck link in there that uh, at least uh, solves one of the problems. But of course, then you're covering the price of a new ATEM Mini. Yeah, the um, and what I would say is that depending on what your project is, you could also find something probably in vMix on the Mac or Mimo Live on the on the I'm mean, sorry, vMix on the PC or Mimo Live on the Mac. Um, we'll both do those, and OBS also is a cost free version um, that that will work um, to do that. But uh, um, on the Mac, it's a little little rough. Okay, we are uh, changing subjects to. Um, uh to the uh to the second hour we're changing subjects to the second hour sorry <laughs> we should just stop fading to black in the, in the second hour because uh it's not working <laughs> so anyway so anyway the um we're going to change subjects now to the second hour and uh welcome everybody and i'd like to welcome renee robin uh i met renee um on a panel we were doing a panel together and uh, she does some amazing work and so we, we wanted to bring her on uh for a second hour renee how are you doing I'm good. I'm a little sleepy this morning. <laughs> Renee good. Ward, Renee warned me that she's not really a, a, a morning person. Uh, where Where are you coming in from? I'm from Alberta, Edmonton, right now. Oh, nice. Anyways, this, today. <laughs> today. <laughs> Very good. Um, it's great. And and Renee, tell us a little bit about what you do. I am a photographer and a digital artist, working largely in Photoshop and Capture One uh, so far. But I am foraying i'm starting the fight into 3d and i feel like i'm starting to learn that 15 years too late i should have started learning that when i was teaching myself photoshop <laughs> you know anything that you get into uh uh you always feel like you're 15 minutes 15 years too late like you know you just until unless you're 15 years old but outside of that it's it's always like oh i should have started this when i was two Definitely. Uh, it would have been so much better now what what 3d app are you using I am just starting Blender and I just downloaded Daz as well, but I'm really interested in Unreal Engine and uh, basically all of it that's out there. But I feel, I mean, I had to get a mouse. <laughs> <laughs> Why did I have to get a mouse? <laughs> right. No, absolutely. It's been um, like the antithesis. It's been like my, my enemy since starting digital art was, you know, you use a tablet and you draw and you do all things. And I got into 3D and I was like, oh, crap. <laughs> I will say that it is a superpower um, to have 3D. We have guys that do pre-press and they, uh, when they got into 3D, they were, so people who do, we say this a lot about production, people who are audio people who do video are way better than people who do video who try to do audio. In the same way, people who come from print um, uh, and go into 3D are way better at 3D than, any, than 3D people who, people who start in 3D because you pay attention to small details. Well, that's, that's encouraging yeah, no, <laughs> because no, right now I opened the program and I'm just like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> so I, mean, I, ta I taught myself Photoshop and Photoshop 7, not even like CS7, but 7 back in the 90s. And I mean, teaching myself Photoshop, then there's nothing like trying to te teach myself Photoshop now. There's so, there was not nearly as many options. So, you know, literally opening the program and like hitting buttons was a way to teach yourself where now I think I would just get lost. <laughs> I remember when we were excited because they added layers in Photoshop. Right? Yeah, so that was so excited for 1991. Layers. It was so exciting. It was like, we're going to add layers. And so yeah. I no longer had to do scripts. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so can you show us a little of your art? Uh, yeah, 100%. I um, wasn't, let's see here, to, to, to do. Unfortunately, I have to do screen sharing, which is kind yeah, of. Yeah, that's totally fine. Totally not fine. Not super exciting, but uh, so here's screen share. Um, yeah, so this is, this is kind of a quick, like smattering of stuff. Uh, can you see that? Okay. So, yeah. And, and so it's a lot of composition. Is that? Is definitely. That, yeah. 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 That's definitely where my superpower lies. Uh, when I started in photography, well, I mean, so I started in this industry, uh, 24 years ago. Wow. <laughs> uh, which and is, what did you start as? Uh, so I started on the other side of start as, as modeling mostly. And, you know, so that really gave me, it was, uh, starting in modeling and trying to understand photography and digital art was kind of like, you know, watching so, Olympic level swimming, but never actually getting your feet wet. <laughs> so you were in front, you were in front of the camera for a long time. And then you, and then, and, and while you were doing that, you were figuring out how to get onto the other side. Um, not really, actually, that wasn't really how it went at all. Mostly I got, okay. I got really, I got really bored about 11 years in. I was like, I swear to God, if I see another picture of someone's face, I'm going to quit. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, but 
Um, and then I just started, I got a point and shoot camera and it had this little flower setting on it, which I know when I was macro and I was like, Oh, I can take pictures of stuff up like really close. And how cool is that? And, you know, I would take right. pictures of like grass with water drops and stand, standard stuff. Right. And, uh, but I also build my, well, at the time I built my own motorbikes and I was, I was riding motorbikes and, uh, I got hit and run over going to work one day. And, uh, and I was just like, uh Oh, like now what all my skills I've ever had involve using my legs and, you know, all of these things. And, you know, cause I went to trade school, I did trades, I did, um, uh, locksmithing. And then I tried out instrument instrumentation as well. And so I was, you know, very much so on this blue collar path. And then all of a sudden I don't have access to my legs anymore. And I can't, you know, like my body, which is the tool I've used to earn my entire living, inc including modeling was taken away. And I was like, Oh my God, what do I do? <laughs> Right. And, uh, so I started, I was just like, well, I've been doing this like photography thing for a little while and I guess, uh, that's wow. what we're doing now. <laughs> and so I couldn't get to the world. And so I had to bring right. the world to me. And this was before, I mean, at the time, you know, digital compositing wasn't really a thing Like creative live didn't exist. Like, you know, trying to learn Photoshop was these really niche, weird graphic design websites where I was just kind of like hacking stuff together. And, uh, I had and what just, years were this, what, what years were, were you doing that? Let's see. I was, that was 13, 14 years ago. Yeah. Something like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. There wasn't, there was, you know, uh, I think Calvin Hollywood had a bunch of like illustration stuff on yeah. there. So there were digital illustrators and photographers, but there weren't a lot of people doing both yet. Yeah. And so I was just like, well, if I can't get out to the world, I'll bring the world to me. So I got this little studio downtown Edmonton, which is, it was like this place where you go where nobody can hear you scream. <laughs> 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 the only reason anybody hired me is because I was female, I think. <laughs> and so you got into, so, so how, so you started doing, and, and this is where you started like going, I'm going to start compositing these photos. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Because I, I mean, I couldn't go out and shoot weddings because I couldn't walk. <laughs> I couldn't shoot like all the normal right. stuff that people do to make money in photography because mm -hmm. I couldn't walk. So I was just like, well, what is the thing that I can do that nobody else can do? And I said, well, I'm in physio learning how to walk again you know, for eight hours a day. And I was like the other eight hours, 10 hours a day, I'll sit in front of the computer and, you know, I'll take the rudimentary Photoshop stuff that I was learning, you know, you know, back in the nineties. Right. And cause I'd always applied that to, you know, digital art. Cause I was, I was an illustrator and, mm -hmm. and I was like, well, let's start smashing this together. Let's see what this is. And, you know, it just, it turned into a thing. It was finding right. people always go like, Oh, when did you want to go into the arts? I'm like, I never did. Right. Right. <laughs> and now I have an arts career. And, so, and, and, and what, what is your, what is the primary, like, what do you um, get hired? Do you get hired to do these or do you sell oh, them yeah. as an original art or how, how what's, what's the, the beef uh, the middle of your business? Um, most of my stuff is uh, I work largely in the advertising and tech sector, which is what I really like. The technology right. sector is my, where I love to play and I love to, because it's so interesting for me watching, uh, you know, illustrators and, and users of the technology push the technology to the limits and then manufacturers going, uh oh, <laughs> they push the limits. Okay, so now what? And then they're catching up. And then there's this like a really fun, like back and forth tag game between the users of the of the software and of the the engineering and everything. And then, you know, the manufacturers of said stuff and this like beautiful yeah. dance back and forth. I love it so much. That's awesome. And and um, can you show us some more of your photos? This oh, is, yeah, tell us a little bit about how you, you this is a mixture of both. Oh, wow, it looks like it's a couple photos there, right? Oh yeah, no, there's, there's a few in this one. Uh, I mean, and in most of these, I also use my artwork sometimes to, uh, tackle the things that I'm afraid of. Right. That's <laughs> I, interesting. So I, this is back when there was discussion about San Andreas fault was starting to like, you know, shimmy a little and everyone's starting to get a little bit uncomfortable. And, and I was like, well, I wonder right. what that would look like, you know, from the Rocky mountain side of like, what right. if we were suddenly ocean view, what, what would that right. look like? Not that obviously we wouldn't get this kind of a curl coming over the mountains, it'd be more of a swell, but yeah, yeah it was fun. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. And, yeah. uh, and you do a lot of compositing with uh, individuals as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hundred percent. There's definitely some of that here. Um, I do photograph like 90, 95% of my own stock as well. Actually with this one here, that big wave, have you ever heard of Titans and Mavericks? Oh uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I was on a, I was on a little boat and the Titans and Mavericks photographing this stuff and my little prairie raised brain was just going, how big are the swells? 50 feet. And, you know, as we're driving out there, looking at these waves that are, <laughs> you know, I'm like big. doing the math on houses. I'm like, okay, eight, 16, 20, we're working on something. And every decision you make just leads to worse decisions and worse decisions. And you're just like going down this path. And like half of my projects. 
Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and so for me, I have a telltale sign when I'm working on images, when they start to go like magenta and this really horrible shade of blue. And it's weird to think that there is such a thing as an ugly shade of blue, but there is. And this image went like right into the, into it. And I had to just like get up and walk away and leave it alone for quite a while and then came back to it with fresh eyes. But uh, yeah, Photoshop and I, we have this this relationship and Photoshop gets jealous because I hang out with Capture One every now and then and I'm like cheating on it a little bit. I'm seeing like Blender on the side now and it's like yeah. not too impressed. And so we have this, <laughs> we have these yeah. battles on the computer. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about like, what's the, um, the uh, with the background, mm -hmm. uh, what, what are the different elements here that you shot? Uh, so the lanterns are the only piece that I didn't photograph. Uh, that's my sister. We photographed in Amsterdam in a studio over there. I do, right. uh, you know, pre the end of the world, I was in Europe quite a bit. And uh, the foreground pieces here of the, the sculptures, this is from a castle in Germany. And the skyline itself is from a mix of um, Ghent and Antwerp. Mm -hmm. And so I just kind of like spliced a bunch of stuff together up there. And did you shoot her in front of green screen or a white or black? Uh, just, just a uh, white, uh, off white, you know, just lit it so that it's not too, not too crazy, but. Do you do much green screen or do you mostly find it a color that makes sense for the composite? Uh, so I make a decision. There's two, there's two ways to approach compositing in my mind. So there's, compo there's uh, photographing for quick extractions and then there's photographing for matching the environment luminance. And right. so either one, you're going to have to do correction. So with right. green screen, yeah, you get a quick extraction, but then you're having to correct for your environment luminance. Yeah, uh, and so in this case, I prefer to shoot for my correct environment luminance and spend the time doing a long mask. Although masking software, the like the one clicks are getting faster and faster. So I'm very grateful for that. <laughs> <laughs> what's your what's your favorite tools right now for extraction? Uh, I mean, the select subject in Photoshop is actually getting pretty good. Yeah. Um, but Boris, Boris effects has come out with, they have a plugin for Photoshop. That's actually totally fabulous. I, I, I was playing around with it a couple of years ago and now like I see how much better it's getting and they have yeah. a whole masking process now that even for like very complicated hair masks is pretty good. Um, but still for, for the most technical masks that are the most messy, I pr like, I'll do it by hand and I'll spend a couple hours at it. Just like, you know, basically the equivalent of hand painting things out. Right. Um, there's an image in here somewhere about, uh, where I, I, I photographed a woman in a white dress on a white background and the mask was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Mistakes were made. <laughs> oh, this is, this is really cool. And, um, the, now the, this is a, you're just taking a couple different positions from the cat and pulling them back together. Yeah. Yeah. This is a really old image. Um, I really right. should rework it because I mean, I can see it now and all the like glaring stuff, but I still have a soft spot in my heart. Uh, because this is the first time I'd ever worked with a cat wanting to like create a monster and um, my first time working with animals for a digital art purpose. So um, yeah, I, I'm always, always casting different types of animals now, but this is definitely like a really fun learning experience of like, Oh God, how do we, Oh no. <laughs> right. No, absolutely. Kids what, and toddlers. <laughs> maybe show us a couple more before we jump to the questions. Oh yeah. If you have questions about how these are getting put together, go ahead and throw them into Makana. Yeah. Yeah. And now was this one shot on, on, uh, on site or was it uh oh no this is all composite studio. all of these are composites yeah yeah, none, yeah. Of these, none of these are photographed on site yeah so where do the we to go back to that one where yeah, did the uh so she shot in front now is this again is this green screen or is it a or is it just shot for her exposure? i have i have a large white studio um, oh right right and right. so yeah it's uh, about uh 35 feet high and um that's great about 30 feet wide and it's just a big cove Right. And uh, we hang all kinds of people in there. <laughs> <laughs> and where did, where did the environment come from? Uh, so this is in uh, pieces of this are from Newfoundland in uh, Bonavista. If you've ever had the opportunity to go there, I do. Um, I split my time out there 50 50. And uh, oh. Newfoundland's just an amazing location for photography and I mean, just adventuring in general. It's a beautiful, beautiful part of the world. And is the sky different? A different a sky oh, yeah, from yeah, another? No, yeah. 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 These are all. They're all hacked and smashed together. So uh, I actually should have popped in a couple of BTS images in here, but uh, yeah. didn't think of that this morning. <laughs> <laughs> it's early. It's early in the morning there. Yeah, uh, yeah. Now, now tell us a little bit about this one, how how it's built. So how did what did you? Where did the spider come from? Okay, so the spider was stuck. That was one I was not brave enough to photograph myself. I do not like spiders. <laughs> this is <laughs> again a tackling the things that I'm afraid of. So in right. this case. Uh, I don't like spiders. So I put super troopers on <laughs> and I zoomed in really, really, really close. And I started masking at the leg hair. And it's like, it's just, it's just the lady's leg hair. It's fine. <laughs> and, and, and is the, uh, um, and where did the, where did the steps come from? 
Uh, so those are from different parts of the UK. So the image itself, there's the guy that I photographed in Toronto. Uh, he's a he's a, uh, a reenactment guy that I work with quite a bit. And uh, yeah, so this is, pardon for all the M's morning. <laughs> uh, but this is here was just like stitched together from different ruin sites in uh, the UK, southern UK. And uh, you know, when you the when big you old spider. <laughs> when you take the, a lot of these are taken and in, in, you're not you, you oftentimes taking those environments. Are you taking them with the thought of this image? Or, yeah, always. Oh, yeah. yeah. And so, so you're matching your focal lengths and matching. Always. Yeah. Perspectives, yeah. everything. Yeah. So when I when I go out and photograph back plates, that's why I love to photograph my own so much and why I, I work with at a great expense to make sure that I photograph them all, because then I can photograph, I can match my lenses. I mean, you know. I basically have just like a, a terabytes and terabytes of background pieces and terabytes and terabytes of subjects that I photographed. And I make sure that I photograph everyone on different apertures, different lenses, different angles, because then I can place them in different places. Mm -hmm. And then the same thing with the background pieces as well. I, I mean, I'm hauling around like two or three different lenses and again, different apertures, angles, tilts, whatever. And then I just start piecing them together like giant puzzle pieces later in post, so. And are you taking notes of like the height of the camera? And I mean, the, the lens information of course is in the in the picture, yeah. but height of the camera, um, that, that type of thing, is there any of that information that you keep? I mean, I have basically what I've made is a formula over the years of how I like to photograph the background pieces and where, what angles I like to photograph people at. And then mm -hmm. it makes things a little bit easier, but I always will, you know, get up on something tall and like weird angles just in case, because, you know, trying to plan for future me. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I, I find that it's been very useful for me. I take lots and lots and lots of reference photos and, yeah. um, and I'm just constantly absorbing them because I'm like, Oh, this is a good wall. I don't know what I'm going to use it for, but I'm going to use this for X, Y, and Z and yeah. textures and reference and backgrounds and stuff like that. That's great. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, and this one's of course shot in the studio, but what did, mm -hmm. how did you stu shoot the, did you hang a lot of that stuff or did you? We had an army ground? of people throwing this dress. So this shot was built on the topic of it, you know, where do the concepts come from and stuff. This whole concept was built around this dress. So this designer reached out to me and she said, I've got 400 meters of seafoam green material and I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> and I said, okay. What does that mean? She said, oh, I'm just going to make something. And I said, okay, for, for how many meters? <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I can figure out something to do with that. With that. Right, yeah, exactly. but, but seafoam green is a very unique color. Yeah. And so she shows up at the studio with this just massive, like multiple bag dress. And we basically just draped it on this model. And I was just like, how do we, how do we do this? Because same thing, you know, do we hang it? Do we what? And I said, well, the, the, it doesn't sit right if we just hang it. So we had like five people around her just throwing <laughs> and we're timing the, the hopping because she has a dance background. And so we're timing her hopping and, you know, the people in the background throwing these massive tentacle dress pieces. Um, right. Yeah. So now it's a wedding dress. And <laughs> That's great. That's really yeah. cool. Yeah. So because, you know, how do you create life? How do you give life to something? that right you know so and and so most of that that whole dress with her is all composite it, it's actually in camera the you dress know, is all in camera yeah that one is yeah right that's great yeah it was a uh, yeah lots of tired arms that day <laughs> yeah yeah no absolutely yeah uh this is a personal favorite of mine actually i have this one printed in my living room and uh I, this is a learning experience of when to photograph flower and the answer is not in your basement ever <laughs> <laughs> Right. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. I spent four years cleaning that flower out of the basement. Oh my God, it's still yeah. never. <laughs> yeah, you, you need kind of a yeah a box that's completely separated from everything else. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. No, outdoors in on the driveway with just a black sheet. Don't ever photograph it indoors. You will never get rid of it. You think glitter is bad? This stuff is worse because it attracts bugs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Maybe maybe one or two more, and then we'll jump to the questions. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. I'm just like popping through. Some so how did you do the how did you do the mermaid? How did you uh, put that is, together? This is just underwater. So yeah. they're just wearing a suit. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the performer. She's in LA. Uh, she runs a mermaid company, which is, a, it's a she sentence a you can only say in LA. Say, wait, 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 she has a mermaid company. Exactly. Yeah. It's a very LA sentence to say. <laughs> that's what I, You're that's not what a pro it. until you've hired a mermaid. Hey, know, it's, it's like, true. What do you do? I'm a mermaid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's literally, it. she has, she has a whole staff of mermaids and they hire out to events. They swim in the, uh, the aquariums like San Diego aquarium, aquarium and stuff like that. They're hired to do these big fancy gala events and it's very very cool and you know kids parties and she's That's, awesome i love it i love that that is a career that they can have that we can have now you know 15 years ago that just wasn't 
a conversation that anybody would have had. And I, I just love it. You know, a lot of people have a lot of bitterness towards the world. And I think some of that is just very, very cool. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, this woman here, she's a professional, she's a, an Olympic athlete, actually. She competed in Sochi in one other. And when I had my motorcycle what does she, accident, what's, what does she do? Snowboarding. Oh, snowboarding. Yeah. Yeah. So she's missing um, her right leg. And when I was run over, my right leg was run over. And so she, I was run over in August and in the spring she had her accident and she had no idea who I was, but I followed her career because I mean, I was still learning how to walk again when she had her accident. I was just going like, Oh, this is terrible. And I had the opportunity to photograph her for her 10 year anniversary from her accident. And she, you know, cause she reached out online and mm -hmm. was like, I'm looking for photographers to make some cool stuff with, you know, to celebrate this 10 year anniversary. And I said, that's so funny because mine was last year and I've followed your career. And so I, I never had the opportunity to meet someone who'd gone through like, you know, a woman who'd gone through something similar, who had done something with, you know, basically the accident triggered a huge chain of event life, like just completely life altering and how could it not be, but had made something more as a result of the accident. I'd never had that opportunity to meet someone like that before. And it was, this, it was almost a little bit emotional for me to, to finally right. meet this woman who has done so much in the, you know, for her industry and for um, athletes, you know, Paralympic athletes and so on. Uh, yeah, it was, it was very, very cool. <laughs> is that, is that her real prosthetic leg or is that something yeah. you Photoshopped? Oh in? no, that's all hers. Yeah, no, I didn't. That was uh, the one thing I didn't Photoshop at all was the prosthetic that she has. Yeah. Uh, we did, we did a couple series of images actually. So um, yeah, she was just like, I kind of want to look like a badass warrior. And I said, absolutely. Let's do it. That sounds totally <laughs> great. I got you. <laughs> that's a great, it's a great leg. I mean, it's a great, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love it so much because I've always had the debate with myself over what was easier because I almost lost my leg, um, to infection. And, right. uh, you know, so I'd always wondered, you know, what the difference was because with my leg, I have a lot of metal inside and as a result, it's rebroken a lot over the years. And so it always hurts. And so I've always wondered, you know, which would have been better, you know, losing the thing altogether and then just moving on with life or, uh, you know, having what I have now. And after meeting her, it was a very interesting perspective, uh, like shift of, you know, the, you know, she can do high action adventure sports and she can do all the things that I wish I could do. And uh, because my leg will just break. Right. right. So, uh, you know, I have like some envy there, but then also the day-to-day -day stuff like getting upstairs um, is much easier for me than it is for her. So it was, it was a very sobering experience also. Uh, but I have, I have a huge amount of respect for this lady. She is tough as nails. <laughs> yeah. I've always, I've always thought, I've always wondered about that. I, I, we had a speaker one time that, that she had three legs, you know, she had a, uh, I mean like three different prosthetic legs and right. one was the comfort leg, like just the, it's comfortable to wear, doesn't look mm -hmm. good. And then the other one was the show leg, which was like, looked amazing and it was like all ornate and everything else that was that, that and then there was like one that was like a sport leg like she works out and it was yeah. like a, it was just funny that she has his accessories that that were there and, and we were because we got we were talking about it while she was prepping for something and it was just a it was a uh and because of the the, the was, i was amazed at how ornate they could become so they're um, art they are art they're yeah. amazing i just met a guy uh in calgary last weekend or two weekend two weekends ago who that's his whole thing is 3d printing prosthetic legs and casts yeah. and everything. And I said, this is so cool. Oh my God. I love it so much. I love that art is now getting into the medical field because why yeah. can't it? Like, you know, she had the whole sheets, the whole front, the foreleg here. Um, there's whole different pattern, like ornate things that she can just clip on. And I was like, that is so yeah. fun. Like, I'm sorry that this happened to you. And I'm sorry that life is hard, but also it's like, that's cool. I yeah. love that. It's a thing now. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So yeah, um, this is just more like stunt performer, rider stuff. And this is the white dress on the white background I was telling you about that sucked to cut out. <laughs> Still looks amazing. <laughs> I super love it. I'm very happy yeah, with it. Yeah, it looks but, it's really, uh, really cool. Yeah, I'm just like... Oh, and, you, and sometimes you're looking at the background and you're basically figuring out the lighting from the backgrounds that you shot earlier. Like, this is what I can get away with. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, what are, you know, yeah. and I mean, because a lot of times I photograph, so the best way to photograph these things are to have your backgrounds photographed already and then you can match your lighting in the studio and that's yeah. that's the fastest and easiest way to do it and i am just not always that person so <laughs> i need lots and lots of options uh, do you ever do any kind of trying to do live compositing so you can make sure that it looks the way it should oh yeah yeah there's there's a whole lot of there's so many steps <laughs> part of the right. reason why why i love 
Capture One so much is with Capture One, you can, uh, there's an overlay feature. So if you have your background built already, right. or at least like loosely put together, there's an overlay feature. So you can load that in. And so it, it hovers over when you're shooting tethered, your mm -hmm. images as they come up. So you can perfectly match your lighting, your perspective, your lens distortion, everything. It, yeah. it was life changing as soon as they came up with that, that overlay feature. There's a lot of things that people love about Capture One, but for me, like that one feature was worth the price of admission and they could do right. nothing else but that feature and I would still pay for it. Right. No, that's amazing. <laughs> We've got some questions stacking up. We're going to throw... Oh, gonna, yeah, gonna, yeah. Gonna, Let's grab pop some of these in here. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, um, so go ahead, Bill. Yeah, the first one comes from... Sharing. Oh, the first we'll one keep comes it up from... if you want to show stuff, but we want to see. We will we'll want to see oh. more. We, I just don't want to make, make people wait any longer. Oh, yeah, 100%. I'm from. so sorry. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah, go ahead, Bill. Terenzio from Vancouver, BC has the first one. Hi, Renee. Love your work. Where and what inspires you when you think of a project? So strangely enough, it's people that inspire me or or like weird random things. Um, so let's say, okay, so this guy, for example, uh, I had met him. He's he's actually a photographer and I met him at a, at a conference and I was looking at him in the crowd because I was presenting there and I was looking at this guy and I was like, man, that guy has the most amazing beard. This is so awesome. Like I can do so much with this guy. I wonder if he would be okay with me taking his picture. And so I just like hit him up and I said, Hey, how do you, have you ever like, you know, modeled before? And he laughed because he's, you know, he's an old trucker. <laughs> he said, no, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> and great. so I said like, Hey man, like let's, let's do some stuff. Like in this case here, you know, it turns out he has a sword and some chain mail. And then I just draped. You As know, one a does. Muslim As one does. Uh, you know, everyone's one got does. one. There. I mean, every grown adult in these age these days now you, got you have beard. to have a sword we've all watched game of thrones everyone needs a sword <laughs> <laughs> um awesome. but mostly yeah it's people it's you know it's it's people and stories and you know when i meet them it's it's you know and same thing with props or locations or something i i never look at people for what they are or locations for what they are but i look at everything as what it can be and what it what is hiding within there you know there's there's mm -hmm. something in everyone that's just waiting to come flying out of them that maybe they don't even know exists. Like this guy had never been photographed like this before. And these are some of my favorite images I've ever taken. Right. I, like, I love these. And um, yeah, I think that's like the long answer is when I meet someone or I go somewhere or I see like a weird little prop, uh, you know, it, it just like, it plants this little seed. And I basically have like a whole garden of seeds that are at various stages of growth <laughs> and like little pots that are boiling in the background as I'm right. marinating away these like stews of different seeds from the garden, you yeah, know, and that's, awesome. uh, that's kind of where it goes. I'm sorry, yeah. rambly answer. <laughs> no, it's fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, next question. Chris Fenwick here on the panel from Emeryville, California. How do you catalog and find images in your terabytes and terabytes of stored images? Oh, that's a really, really good question. Uh, late night panic. <laughs> <laughs> That's a strategy. Ah. Um, <laughs> where did I put that? Where did I put that photo? I think it's on the drive that's sitting over on the shelf. That yeah, that part's frustrating. <laughs> no, uh, so I mean, on on top of late night panic, I do sort everything. So my backgrounds are sorted by location and then by year. So if I've gone to a place, um, everything is sorted by what year I went somewhere. And then if I've been to a place twice, then I have that location with the different years that I was there. And, uh, and then with people, cause I don't have, I don't use Lightroom or anything like that for cataloging because I mean, I, I burn through computers so fast. It's just a pain to constantly be doing all the steps. So I just have, these hard drives are all background pieces. These hard drives are all element pieces. These hard drives are, you know, uh, personal work clients, you know, and then these hard drives are my commission clients and, uh, sort by year and then just like do a quick hail Mary and hope I don't get too many more concussions. <laughs> Yeah, the um, I, one of the things I got in the habit of with my still still camera a lot of times when I'm taking them around the world is I would take I'd be taking photos and I pull my iPhone out and take a photo above it with the camera in the shot. Yeah. Um, and what that did is it just gave me a GPS location, you know, and yeah. then I could put those in later. But it was really important because I kept on opening up photos. I was like, I don't know exactly where when I I took that, you know, and yeah. and definitely having my clock set on my camera was super valuable. Oh my God. Clock set on camera is a must. You have to, you, you have to not, do that. When you open it up and it says 1999, you're like, what have I done with my life? I have made bad choices. This is not a good day. <laughs> exactly. Uh, next question. Bo Cordell in Charleston, South Carolina is up next. He says, have you explored turning your art into NFTs? That, that is a question that I get a lot. And I'm working on a project now that if I was ever going to chase the NFT rabbit, 
that will probably be uh, one of them. And well, I'm working on I'm working on my art book, and so there are pieces within the art book that will possibly get turned into NFTs. But I am not chasing that too hard yet. I my interest in NFTs isn't necessarily the minting of artwork, but I'm fascinated by NFTs by what that that technology can mean for us in five to ten years, what it can mean for documentation, what it can mean for medical record history, what it can mean for you know so many other things. So I love the idea of NFTs, but I I don't really I'm not too invested in what it is right now. And at the end of the day, if somebody comes up to me and says, hey, I want to buy you know, your series of NFTs for X amount. At the end of the day, I am a commercial photographer and I work professionally and this is how I feed myself. So I will probably fall down that rabbit hole one of these days. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Matt Halverson in Brookings, South Dakota says, I've always heard the depth in a photography, in a photograph or image is part of what makes it so great. How do you choose what your top layer is to feature? Ooh, that is a very good question. I've never been asked that question before. You have good questions here. How do I choose we, what we, is we my We pride top ourselves. We, we pride yeah. ourselves on our questions. Well done. Golf club to that. Uh, <laughs> what do I choose my top layer? I mean, anxiety again, probably just like working, working on it, working on it. And, you know, a lot of, you know, this works, this doesn't work. Sometimes with images, especially if I'm working with like an art department or like an art director and as a commercial client, we have pre-visualized the whole thing out in detail and we know exactly what we're going to do going in. If I, so, you know, in that regard, then, you know, my, my atmospheric elements are probably my top layer. Um, you know, and then of course, on top of like sharpening, like sharpening and all that kind of stuff at the end. Right. But that's probably where it would be. Uh, but when it comes to personal work, it's just this like chaotic 3 a.m. brain of like, let's try this. And oh, that didn't work. And let's try. Oh, nope. <laughs> so. And yeah. And how much how much of, do you think your work is personal versus professional? I am super greedy about that. So I learned earlier on in my career because I burned myself hard, burned myself out really, really hard on commercial work. Mm -hmm. And I just fried my brain. And I was just like. I am never, ever, ever letting myself do this to myself ever again. So I'm very greedy with my personal work time because I know that if I don't feed the reason why I love doing this and, you know, the why, the why it's fun, then everything else falls apart. So I probably try to be like 40% personal work, 60% commercial. Yeah, um, that's great. I, I do everything I can to persuade my commercial clients to pay for my, my personal ideas. Same. Oh, my God. Like, I, I, I have a crazy idea. Let's do it. Uh, yeah. Next question. Uh, on kind of the same thing, Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana says, how many layers are these photos composites of dozens or hundreds? Ooh. So this one falls under the dozens. Uh, this one was probably like 10 or 15. So not very many. Uh, but there's one here. Uh, this one was a lot. <laughs> this one a was lot. if it was Many. if this was a marriage, we would have we would have divorced. <laughs> but you worked through it. You worked through it together. We worked through it together. Yeah, it was a lot. Uh, this was a lot as well. And you, the worst part is you can't even tell. This image is another one that I, I made earlier on in my career. I came back to five years later because I was like, I know there's something in this, and I finally. Uh, you know, figured it out because it was too flat and whatever, but it was, it was so many, so many pieces. <laughs> next, next question. <laughs> Sky Gleason in Seattle here on the panel says, when you first started photography, how did you not get lost in the shiny new camera gear trap? Oh, poverty. <laughs> oh, no. I'll do it. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was, I mean, the whole reason I was building my own motorbikes is because I didn't have any money. I mean, I was, you know, I was working in the trades, but I mean, I also had like a host of health issues. Like I had four years of radiation treatment. And so like work was on and off and, you know, so uh, yeah, just like not access to funds, but there was a bunch of stuff that I wanted to do. And I was just like, I will put this together however I have to. And if that meant like buying two motorbikes that didn't work and making one that did fine. If that meant, you know, using a point and shoot that, you know, was given to me or whatever, or buying a old used digital, I had my first SLR camera was a Nikon D80 that I bought off of a university kid, allegedly, uh, because he needed money for school, allegedly. And I think it was true. <laughs> right. But yeah, that was it. I, I think that those constraints oftentimes make us a lot better at what we do. You know, I know 100%. that. Yeah. I mean, I had so little rendering when I did when I was doing 3D, you know, in the 90s. 
and you got into a pattern that I'm still much better at it now when I, even though I have all this power, horsepower, I still, my, the process that I use is very efficient because I didn't have a way to do it any other way. 100%. Yeah, absolutely. I, I taught myself lighting using a fridge, like a fridge. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I was That's blocking great. light and being like, what is this catch light word? Because I was modeling people like, oh, the catch lights and the highlights and whatever. And I was just like, whatever. I have a good taste. I know what good images look like. But I don't know how to make it. So I was like, catch light. What is that? So I put a flower in the fridge and like sprayed it with water. And I was like, I think it's eyeballs. So I was like blocking. <laughs> and I was like, oh, when I do this, that creates. And yeah. So, you know, lighting one one was in a fridge. <laughs> That's awesome. Next question. Sky Gleason back from Seattle saying, are the new video cameras that capture images in RAW a tool that you use? I don't yet, but I, I think that's really fun and I'm really, really excited about it. I, I am so stoked about the technology. I am definitely one of these people that's just screaming towards a Blade Runner future and full throttle. And I love <laughs> I Are you love doing much technology. video work? I'll do a little bit of it, actually. Uh, not tons, because I mean, I'm, I've still only run my Canon 5D Mark III. So when I need to do a video job, I just rent cameras. Right. But I... I think it's really awesome. And I think it's really interesting. I, my problem is that with video currently, I am stuck with what I'm looking at and I don't like that. <laughs> I like to, I want to add crap in there, but also I'm not good at after effects yet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, uh, ever since Harry Potter came out, I was like, I just want to do images that are like little three or four second loops, you know, like, like the, like the, uh, and just, and just, you know, play with them and everything else. I don't want to do a long piece. It's just like a, a little, little piece of, of, uh, of visual effects that looks like you, a photograph, but things just kind of. You are going to love my art book then. <laughs> oh, very good. Yeah. That's very cool. Um, next question. Nate Hill in Salt Lake City is interested in your preferred approach to talent. Do you like to use agencies and professional models or everyday civilians? All of the above. It literally depends what I'm casting for. So if we share the image that, that I have shared right now, uh, you know, I am interested in characters. I'm interested in, in people who want to be there, who love to make interesting stuff. So this woman, she's a veteran and I had photographed her husband because he's a photographer and he's posed for me a ton. Strangely enough, I, I've had her husband published in like a bunch of magazines as a model because of course he's in the Canadian military. And so this woman as well as a veteran. And, you know, I took this photo of her husband and she said, oh my God, I want one like that of me. And I said, absolutely, 100%, let's do it. And I said, can you grow your hair out just a little bit? Because my traveling schedule was crazy and hers was as well. And so, you know, time went by, enough time went by and her hair was longer. And I was like, sweet, let's throw some furs on you. Let's make an awesome, like, let's make this like beautiful, strong character of you because you've literally been to war and back. And, you know, like, let's show that strength and that experience in your face. So I do, I do love to cast um, models and actors. So this guy here, he's an actor as well. And, but I mean, at the end of the day, I want to work with people who want to be there and who want to have fun and they want to do cool stuff, you know, and yeah. that's, that's my sweet spot. And if they come from an agency, awesome. And if I run into them into, in a cafe and they have a really great attitude and I stalk them on social media for a little bit, just to make sure that they're like, you know, an interesting person that maybe I want in my network, then that's what I do. So absolutely. Yeah. And next question. Uh, it comes from our own Chris Fenwick here on the panel of Memoryville, California. Do you by chance have a PSD file ready that you could take us on a behind the scenes tour Ooh. of one of your pieces and show us how you organized your layers? <laughs> do you have I anything can, around? I, I can, um, let me pop in a hard drive here and I can yeah. find that that horrible one that was really that really bad one <laughs> yeah, chris is very yeah, excited yeah. you could also show us a good one <laughs> I, mean, I know but the bad ones are more fun everyone shows their best work and yeah. it's so fun in my mind anyways to show the stuff where you're just like so let me tell you oh man did i ever make bad choices <laughs> But yeah, um, if you can uh, feel free to ask another question while I look yeah, at this. Yeah, absolutely. I can do two Let's go to the next. Ones, I think. Dave next Troutman's up next from Edmonton, Canada, and he says Edmonton, you've been. What up? Yeah, Edmonton. He's in, he said, you've inspired me to get back to my personal projects to rebalance my creative enthusiasm. Great work and hello from Edmonton. So you guys are simpatico here. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I, I have to admit we we have a we have a uh, a stage right now and there's there's a green screen pocket and I'm now thinking like what's inspired me talking to you is like I should have my kids out there like doing like dressing up and doing cool things and do it before they get older um, and be 
take some photos. That's really great. Um, I mean, they're only little ones. I mean, that was yeah. an interesting uh, statement my mom said to me once. She said, it's very weird. And, you know, I was in my late 20s at the time. She said, it's very weird that one day that little child that you knew just doesn't exist anymore. The little the little kid is gone my, and it's replaced I, by by like a woman um, of questionable taste and questionable you know, decision making. <laughs> Moms can get away with that. You, you know, I, I uh, um, my son a month ago became taller than me, and uh, mm. and that was a moment like I was like, oh, you know, like, you know, and and you know, it's it's a it's a crazy, uh, yeah, crazy thing. So you're right; they just get they get big and they have you know just it's, it's a very odd thing. Anyway, it's a very odd thing. Yeah, definitely. I'm just yeah. gonna plug this in. Feel free to keep asking questions. I don't Absolutely. know what our timeline is here on how much we have space a little bit. And we have a little bit more time and we have one more question right now. So if, oh, if the producers have more questions, uh, let us know. Otherwise, we'll look at some more photos. Yeah. Uh, next question. Chris Widener has a good one, but this may be another rabbit hole. Your lighting, he says, is amazing. What's your process for getting those great metal highlights without blowing out the faces? Ooh. So uh, my secret squirrel on that, which I rarely talk about. So this is special for you guys <laughs> as I dig through cables. Um so the biggest one is uh, shoot bounce light instead of direct, instead of putting your soft light, your soft right. boxes and everything right on the subject. Uh, definitely. I mean, you can have your main light on them, but then have your fill bouncing off of, you know, whether it's bounce cards or the walls or the ceilings or whatever, and then drop your highlights in post. There you go. <laughs> no, no, absolutely. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, next question. Nate Hill in Salt Lake City says, how important is it to get a signed model release form? Oh, get them because so my dumbass. What? Pardon the language. I apologize. <laughs> All good. <laughs> uh, when I was first starting out, was like, oh, I don't really, you know, like model releases, whatever. Like, I don't really know what I'm doing yet. Maybe this isn't really going to be a full career and everything else. But let me tell you, now I'm working on an art book and I'm having to find these people. <laughs> right. Pain in the butt. <laughs> yeah. No. Absolutely. So, I mean, you know, uh, you don't. You don't need them, but you really should have them. And yeah. there's there's lots of apps you can get on your iPad or whatever. There's just tons of places to get model releases, and it's just it's just easier if you have them. And I mean, to be fair, with this art book project, I'm sending out a new release form to everyone, anyways, because okay, we worked together ten years ago. It doesn't mean you want your face in a book. Maybe you have a completely different life now, right? And you're not necessarily okay with that. But it's so much easier if you have. Yeah, no, so absolutely. Yeah. Uh, next question. Chris Fenwick back again from the panel in Emerysville, California. What is your preferred hard drive you purchase, either brand or model? And have you ever lost a drive? I've definitely lost drives. Everyone's lost drives. There's two types of hard drives, dying and dead. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. What's your, what's your preferred hard drive right now? To be honest, this is ridiculous, but these little Adata drives... Mm -hmm. There are Seagate drives, like these things, I have had them all over the world. I have dropped them downstairs by accident, like kicked them. They've been stepped on, whatever. These little drives like keep coming back for more. And I have to admit, I'm pretty impressed. Um, now, because I travel, I mean, like pre the end of the world, I traveled quite a bit. And uh, so what I would do is because they're living in my backpack and they're getting like shaken and kicked around all the time is I change them out every 18 months or less. You know, um, because I have to travel with a certain number of client images as well, because I'm working on stuff all the time. And then I have to travel with my with all my uh, hard drives for my backdrops, because, you know, if I'm doing a job in Europe for Wacom, for example, right. um, you know, I need access to those files. Uh, so and I also just never know when a client job is going to come up and they say, oh, you know, hey, we shot like, you know, two years ago. And uh, so it turns out we have some some budget and oh, we need this thing. And oh, can you can you get it to us by like, you know, eh, tomorrow? <laughs> yeah. You're like, wow, oh, it's a good thing I have everything with me. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Renee, Renee, realistically, how many terabytes of, of images do you think you have stored slash catalog? Uh, do you want to see me cry? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, is it uh it's a it's a it's a lot. Uh I think here. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. So there's about 16 gigs on this desk or 16 terabytes, 16 gigs, 16 terabytes <laughs> on this desk right now. And then, uh, you know, I have uh, like bags and bags of backup drives, old drives that are just in 
backpacks hidden in different locations that are on and off site. <laughs> and then, of course, uh, you know, stuff back geocached up around the globe for you to go swing by and grab a drive full of <laughs> skylines or something. Yeah. Well, I mean, mostly, uh, well, anything that I'm currently using, I travel with. So that's the that's the big stack of I just have a ton of these that sit in my backpack. Great. Um, and then, of course, I have stuff backed up online as well. But then, you know, it, in the interest of having data. So at the start of 2020, I was targeted in a huge hack, which like, I mean, they got into my bank account, even which is saying something like, I don't even know. Even the bank hasn't been able to give me a clear answer on how that actually happened. Uh, and I think it was from there was an MGM hack at the same or a leak around about eight months earlier. And so anyways, I think that's where my data was was uh, swiped from. But anyways, after that, I realized that, you know, fortunately, so I lost my .com, which sucks. They're holding it ransom. They just want to, they want me to pay them like a few grand to get it back. And they're just stubborn and not giving it to them. And, but I realized at the time where I was just like, okay, fortunately of all the things that they got into, they never once got into any of my client data. They never once got into any of my, my, the stuff that actually feeds me like, okay, sure. They got my .com, whatever, bank account stuff, fine. You know, I was like, we're able to get some of that stuff back and some of it were not, whatever. But the most important thing in our industry is the data that we can't replace and they didn't get it. And so I felt really good about that because having only online backups is also a, a weak point. It's, a, it's, you know, you're always, I'm always looking at, for anybody who's worked in engineering, I'm always looking at my life and doing a gap analysis and figuring out where the the empty spots are and where things are starting to screw up yeah and uh and so fortunately that was the one thing that i was like okay i got one thing right <laughs> next question sky gleason back again i like this one how did you give yourself permission to be an artist i didn't i got run over man <laughs> there was oh. no permission that, that, so and it, like i tell people i was fortunate enough to get run over by a vehicle in a motorcycle accident um and because there is a purity to when all of your, so we're talking about, you know, working in 3D uh, when you have limited options available to you. You know, I got, I got run over and I could have gone into computer programming, but I didn't really know anything about it. Right. But I had just started, you know, doing photography. And so there is a simplicity when you are removed of options. Right. And so if you need permission to be an artist then you just start cutting off all the fat on you know why you can't and right. then suddenly what you're left with is well now you have to <laughs> right right no absolutely so does the word survival fit into that somewhere yeah right absolutely um, next yeah. question boy good questions today paul wallace in austin texas has this one can you talk about backlighting and bokeh yeah, I mean, so compositing it, Photoshop keeps crashing for some reason. I'm going to try 2019. Uh, so I don't do a lot of backlighting, mostly because, so when I'm doing my composites, there's there's two types of styles of for, for lighting anyways. So there's there's lighting for the environment, and then there's lighting for, you know, as if it was lit with strobes on location, right? And environment lighting is fun, and it looks pretty and everything like that, and it makes for very believable composites. But aesthetically, I like to make images that look like strobe lighting on location. I just hate shooting strobes on location. Uh, so it's, you know, making those kinds of decisions. I also don't work a lot in low aperture. So when I'm shooting on location, strangely enough, I'll photograph low aperture. But in the composites, I just don't like the aesthetic as much. Uh, I find that the blur tools that are available to us, they don't emulate what the lenses do if you actually shot it on location well enough. I can always see like, oh, that was Gaussian blur or, oh, that was like box blur or, oh, that was this or that. And so it takes it takes me out of the composite. It takes me out of the artwork. So I, I don't know if that's like really answering the question for you. I mean, like backlighting is a very cinematic thing. You see it a lot in movies and it looks interesting. And it's like, you know, it's basically forcing the eye to look at the subject and be like, bam, this is where it is, even though the lighting doesn't really necessarily make sense to the to the scene itself um you know but it's there for a purpose it's, it's lighting it's lighting that has a job <laughs> if that makes sense no, um yeah so it's just it's just decisions that you that you make going forward on your own and there's a lot of like noodling on that yeah one of the things that i've been playing with with um that i just started playing with because i do a lot of photogrammetry and right. is playing with taking 
the photo. So when I'm going to take a photo of something is to walk around and uh, scan, you know, get a bunch of photos that I can turn into a 3D model because then I can project those back, those images back onto the 3D model that was based on them. So I was shot at the same, this was a, what I learned is you can't go back and do it because everything changes. And so I, right. you know, so I shot, so sometimes I'll take um, a photo of something and then I'll take a hundred photos around it so that I can build a 3D model of it. So, so then I have that data later you yeah, know, to, to 100%. do that. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's like, and that's, that's the biggest thing is that you can't, you can't create new data where there is no data. Yeah. I mean, you can try, and there's lots of, you know, ham fisted ways that we can make up for that. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah. you know, you, you need your elements, you need your pieces in order to put it together. It's often why I like to drive, drive to LA on, on by myself, <laughs> because my, my family does not like to put up with what, when, when dad says he's going to get out and take a photo, it's, it's hundreds of photos <laughs> and it's yeah. like a half an hour. Cause oh, I really like this uh, next, yeah. next question. Exactly. Um, Dating photographers rough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Marrying one's word. <laughs> this one comes from Marty Adius in Maryland, an old friend of ours, and he says, many of your composites feature people standing on uneven terrain. How do you match where feet and clothing meet the ground? Uh, so you, you fake it. <laughs> um, but the, I mean, there's two ways. So of course, one of them being is you just place them on something that's uneven as well. Uh, so I mean, if I'm photographing on paper, which is my least favorite thing to do, uh, if, you know, if I'm doing like stairs or something like that, I'll put something underneath like books or something like that. And then the paper itself will roll. Uh, and then I'm still getting the environment luminance that I'm looking for. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, there's just, there's just lots of ways. I mean, you can like liquefy the feet a little bit. You can like, you know, just push things oh, yeah. around. There's, there's lots of teeny tiny little hacks that you can play with. And, and, and oftentimes you are working with us with the background first, right? So you kind of know where they need to be yeah. sometimes. Oh, not always. Never mind. Okay. Client, client work, nine, like commercial work. Yeah. hundred percent. You have to, because there, you can't be like guessing. It's like, okay, we're shooting this. This has to be done the next like 36 hours. There's no time to screw around. So right. background pieces are always found first on commercial jobs, especially if I'm working with an art director, you know, right. like all the pre-work that goes into it means that the photography and the post-production actually goes quite quickly. But right. then for personal work, kind of like the one that I'm going to walk you guys through here today. Um, and uh, I didn't find the original background plate piece that I put together, but I, I have where it all goes to where it all goes out the window. Um, <laughs> Are you ready to but, show it? You can go ahead and go ahead and, and oh, yeah, show it yeah, to us. Yeah, for sure. Um, but anyways, yeah. So with, with those kinds of things, it's uh, I'm going to hit the stop sharing things so I can reshare uh, here. But yeah, if you're, if you're really looking to match this stuff up and do a good job, like the background pieces first and, but then sometimes you're me and you make bad decisions or you're just like impulsive <laughs> and uh, you have to do something else. So, um, but at the end of the day, I mean, even, even when we're talking about like, you know, photogram, photo, photogrammetry or photogrammetry, uh, photogrammetry, photogrammetry, right. I always mm. screw that word up. It's one of those words also that I only ever read and I never hear, <laughs> but I mean, even with that in a worst case scenario, let's say you missed a splice, you know, yeah. you can kind of like patch that together in, in 3d, if you have to, you know, right. figure something out and is it perfect? No. And I mean, especially in the world of photo bashing, photo bashing is all about hacks and smashing right. stuff together. And I mean, uh, there's a really great YouTube channel. Uh, can I talk about YouTube channels on here that I love? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so there's a really great YouTube channel called Photo Manipulation. And these guys are photo bashers. They're a bunch of, uh, a bunch of them are book cover artists uh, right. and oh, yeah. you know, concept artists and stuff like that. And these guys are smashing together concepts in like 50 minutes. And right. it is like every weird trick in the book that like you never even knew existed to turn around and like turn out artwork like one per hour and it gets ridiculous. This stuff hurts yeah. my mind. These guys are amazing. Oh, that's um, great. So yeah, if you're looking for hacks. Any so this is, this is how this photo got started. Mm -hmm. is, yeah, is this, this is where you started. Is this the yeah. first photo or? Yep. Yeah. yeah, this is, this is, this is the image itself that I chose. Mm -hmm. um, and then in this case here, uh, just for like the cleanliness of my own brain, uh, you know, I figured out the size. I always make sure that I have my original, person uh right. and what i do now uh, as i've learned from making this file i also save my original mask <laughs> so i have to <laughs> make it useful. later again and yeah. again yeah no mistakes are made on this file um but anyway so this is this is kind of the size where i decided up on it and then like i said this original background piece here at least i couldn't find it very quickly so i was just like well I'll just go mm. with this but uh you know there's there's like you know you can see some of the the masking errors here and like you know this was relatively cleaned up but um you know 
mistakes, mistakes, mistakes. <laughs> That's great. And then, then it just keeps building, right? What? Oh yeah. Yeah. No, it definitely keeps, it definitely keeps <laughs> building uh, in very terrible decisions. So uh, first things first. So, you know, this, none of this is color balanced or anything. Uh, you know, this, the horizon right. line here, there's even like this hiccup here that I didn't fix or anything. Uh, but um, yeah, so I do find if I have to build a really big background environment piece, I'll build the environment piece first, and then right. I will bring all of that into uh, Photoshop after that. So it just goes a little bit quicker. Anyway, so I'm trying to unify the colors here. So I do a curves adjustment, a hue saturation. Mm -hmm. So right. strangely enough, uh, in 2015, I had, a, I had a brain injury, I had a concussion, and then I had a TIA, and then I had a really bad concussion after that. It was about three months apart. And um, and I was, I was at creative live because I was just, you know, and this is, I had post puncture migraines and everything. And I was, uh, if you've ever had a spinal tap, it's not good, but anyways, so I was looking at this and I was looking at the world and I was like, why does everything look different? I don't understand why everything looks different in a way that I couldn't really explain. Right. So have you ever done those hue tests, like this hue awareness test where you have to adjust all the chips yeah. in the right order. Mm -hmm. So I had been doing those my whole career and I would only, the best I ever got was like 75% right, you know, and it was not very right. good. So this is how I used to color grade because I couldn't see color. And then right. after this brain injury, weirdly enough, I was, I was in uh, the hotel lobby across from Creative Live and I was staring at stuff. Do you ever remember the book called The Giver? I, I've heard of it. I haven't, I, haven't, I haven't read it. So it was, this, it was like mandatory reading when I was younger. And it was this, it's a story about a kid who lives in a world where everything's black and white. And there's this guy called The Giver and he gives this gift to one person in the village and it's the ability yeah. to see color. There's this, this scene in this book that I will always remember because of this, where he throws the ball and this kid's like, and the ball changed, but I don't really understand how it changed. It didn't change in shape. It didn't change in anything, but it was different. And I was looking at the world and I was looking at everything in this, in this hotel lobby in Creative Live. And I said, why does everything look different? I don't understand. And I started doing, and I realized, I said, well, green isn't just green anymore. I was like, I can see Right. all these different shades of green that I'd never been able to see before. Wow. And I, I did a huge adjustment, a hue awareness test, like, like in the hotel and I got a hundred percent and I was like, did I just benefit from that concussion? <laughs> yeah, it just realigned a couple things there for you. That's exactly what happened. Yeah. It was so bizarre. Um, anyway, so more bad decisions. So, uh, I just overlaid some cloud layers here and I did uh -huh. like, like the worst masking job known to man. It's just, like, look at that <laughs> look at that line god right. um <laughs> and i mean this is uh you know just put on a multiply blending mode and uh you know just bad bad masking uh this is where it gets worse um that makes more sense here uh this is the order chaos thing that i was talking right. about where you're just like bad decisions to worse 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 and so this is also where we're starting to go like oh these are bad these are bad choices. These are not good. Um, and this is, so I obviously deleted some files here in rage. So I apologize. Right. Some of that is a little bit out of order. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you know, I was just like, what is happening? Just like, there's something here. I know there's something here, you know, when you work on something and you're just like there's something good, I know there's something good here, but I can't see what the heck is going on. I don't understand it. And so more bad decisions. And then I tried doing frequency separation to like fix my masking errors, uh, which, you know, you get these halos here, right? Mm -hmm. uh, whoops, as we move stuff. So frequency separation and just like from bad to worse. And like at this point, like Photoshop and I are just like screaming at each other in the kitchen, just being, you know, like Photoshop's not only seeing Capture One anymore and like <laughs> blenders on the side being like, yeah, but I'm fun and I'm new and fresh. And like Photoshop's like super jealous. <laughs> right. So it's just like we are having it out. Like we are throwing the pots and pans at each other. Like, I never want to see you again. Like, you know, it's just it's just bad. Like we need marriage right. counseling in the worst way. And this is where this is my cue. This is that everything's blue. gone too far. Oh, God. Yeah. And just like the muddiness and the grossness and the awfulness. And like, so this is the other thing I do when I'm really stuck. And I'm like, let's just throw some nebulas on it. I don't know. And I'm just right. like, like, to, you know, Photoshop, like, let's do counseling. You're like how about how about some rum how about we just drink this problem away right and yeah. just it's it's bad yeah. <laughs> it's and how so did it ha and we saw how it came back is, is you have the final composite is this part of the yeah. final composite? oh yeah this is part of it. i kept this it just in walking here. through it yeah, yeah yeah this is just like the, the path you know, yeah more or less so there's definitely some deleted stuff in there where i just like rage quit uh right <laughs> how long did you work on this project <laughs> i worked on this for uh couple days shit two days too long right. i should have quit i should have quit here 
and I didn't. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> I'm stubborn. I'm one of those like A type yeah. personalities of like, I can fix this. It's fine. Must close loop. Must close loop. Yeah. Must close loop. Yeah, exactly. And just like, not, it's not good. So, mm. anyways, so I just like nuked all of this out. And there's something else here that needs to go away. One of these. Oh man, where are you? There it is. So I basically cut it down to here. Right. And I was just like, okay, this is before it all went bad. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> we, went back, we went back to that, that crossroad. Yeah, yeah. Photoshop and I are just like, okay, all right. So I shouldn't have come home tired from work. And Photoshop's like, mm -hmm. yeah, no, like I, like I know that we're like in an open relationship and I shouldn't have been jealous and it's fine. And like, <laughs> these are the terms that we agreed on that you were going to see other software and it's okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> and like meanwhile, well, my old Nikon is sitting there being like, right. oh, you're so rude you know, you just like switch teams for Canon. How dare you? And so it's like, you know, <laughs> telling like horrible right. lies into Photoshop's ears that like I'm never exactly. going to see it again. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I literally went into Nick software. Right. Try something. You know, if I, can get I, that. I did a cross balance. That was it. I just opened oh up gosh. into Nick yeah. software and just cross balance. And I was like, oh my God, there it is. And I could just like right. feel it's like even working on this, I get this tension in my chest and in my fingers, yeah. you know, when you, you know, when you're working yeah. on something, you're it's just not like, coming out physical yeah. reaction. And then I just did a cross balance and that was it. And I was like, oh my God, I just wasted so much time. And this is the importance, I think, of having a nap when you're working on artwork and projects like this is like, just. Have, I'm a heavy napper. Have a nap. I, I, oh I don't God. nap more than 15 minutes, but I do it a couple of times a day oftentimes because it, it, I, I just need to let things settle down and figure, figure their way out. And I just need to like, my, my brain is like, I'm like, okay, I need to just sit down for a second and just, just let it do its thing. And then I come out exactly. with an answer usually. Yeah. 100%. And that's exactly what this was. It was, it was, it was like nap and time away and yeah. like just like color decision changes and like messing around. So this one here, I was, I went into um, ACR, I just merged everything up and started like pushing sliders around. I always tell people right. my color grading is I push sliders till it sucks less. Um, <laughs> no, absolutely. But uh, yeah, then just like a frequency separation to clean up, re clean up the mask errors again uh, right. and then curves and then pop back into ACR again. So in this case here, I was just pushing uh the highlights a little bit and then you know adding a little bit of clarity and detail and stuff like that but uh i mean that's that's how you don't build a psd layer but it's also how you can <laughs> it's how you can bring them back when everything goes bad <laughs> it's just like, uh, that's awesome Renee, break. i think we need to have you come back with just one photo <laughs> and no, I, I'm not kidding. You think I'm kidding. I, I think that like once a month, if, if you're open to it, I'm just going to, I'm just going to put you on the spot here. We would love right. to have you come back with one photo with one composite and just work through it and answer questions. Would you be open to that? I'm down for that for sure. Yeah, oh my gosh. Fun. It's so amazing to watch. It's so much fun too. Like it just, it's really, really fun to, to, to work with this on you uh, work with this, you know, these through these photos with you. It's really, really good. Well, so I'll I, try to, I'll try to pick some that weren't, weren't such a, a cluster yeah. to, to work through. I'll get, I'll get some better ones. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. Amazing. Thank you so much for your time. Dude, thanks so much for having me. I realize we're a couple minutes over. I'm so sorry. But, no, no, it's uh, totally fine. I I do have a production I have to run to, so I was like, I was like, hey, I, I, I couldn't wait. I couldn't wait. So I <laughs> so I uh, I was like, I, I mean, I have to. I was like, I have to uh, wait 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 for her to finish uh, before I run off to my project. So um, I will really, give myself time. <laughs> no, 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 it's totally fine. Totally fine. It was an incredible hour with you. So so thank you. Uh, thank you so much for joining us early. I'm sorry. It'll yeah. always be early. So that's, that's why I'm I, I will tape last next time. Hopefully I won't be finishing a job at three in the morning. And I was just <laughs> yeah. like looking at the clock going, all right, four hours of sleep. Go. <laughs> well, that was fantastic. fantastic. Thank, thank you again. I appreciate it. Thanks so much, guys. Have yeah. a great day. Okay, you too. And uh, thanks to our producers for the great questions. As always, uh, really, really good questions, insightful. Uh, yeah, it's really, really well done. And uh, thanks to our panelists. We can't do this without you. And thanks to the production staff, the huge production staff all over the world that's producing the show every day. Um, you'll see a whole bunch of names go by here in a second. And, um, and that's all the people that it takes to get this actually done. So thank you again. All right. And now we're going to jump into After Hours. Thank you, Renee. So much fun. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> thanks again, guys. I appreciate you having me on. <laughs> oh, so good. I'm sorry for getting you up so early. <laughs> I used to be I used to be out late, and I know how much it hurts to have to suddenly shift schedules. But it's good. Well, I your... just had a bunch of commercial work this week, and we just like it all yeah. had to get done. So yeah. I was just like, okay, yep. it's gonna be a long day. <laughs> all right, here we go. We're gonna jump. I want to connect with your Creative Live background too. I'm sorry. Creative Live, mm -hmm. based here in based here in Seattle originally. So yeah. So I'm familiar with, with the guys over there. 
Oh yeah, you know all them over there. Oh yeah, that's right because there's a person in Seattle there. Right on. That's 